What's going on, everybody? We are live, and uh, tonight my guest is John Stumpf. And John is a uh, in real life friend who I met, uh, funny enough, over Facebook Marketplace. Uh, randomly happened to uh, come across my stuff, and uh, he he drove to my house, picked up some stuff, and we've been friends ever since. John, thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very, very happy to be back. It has been a while. Uh, we, we've both been very busy, but yeah, it's always nice to get somebody that lives locally that we can hang out with and and do random stuff with. I think, uh, uh, if I remember right, the only thing that we've watched together is Hack lantern from Masker Video. We did, we did Hack lantern and uh, Stage Fright. Oh, Stage Fright. Yeah, with the owl head. Yeah, yeah, I forgot that was together. That is a great movie. Yeah, we did. A, that was a double feature that night. So. Nice. Yeah, I love Stage Fright. Uh, Hack o' Lantern, not so much. Um, <laughs> uh, how's everything been? You've been uh, super busy on your side of the world. Oh yeah, I, all the time. Works, work. <laughs> you know, and just uh, <laughs> keeping up with movie watching. Of course, always trying to do that daily if I can. Um, I kind of went through a rut there for a little while in January. I just wasn't. I had no inspiration to watch anything. Um. But I got out of that funk by watching Rocky. So, you know, that's that's like the most inspiring movie, you know. So got me back in the movie watching and watching lots and lots and lots of stuff now. So we're good. Good. Uh, John has a really interesting sort of like collecting endeavor. John has been trying to collect all of the uh, all of the films that have been nominated for Best Picture ever. And how uh, how's that goal going at the moment? Uh, my shelf is full now. <laughs> so I've got so I put I put the green screen behind me for movies because I didn't want you to see my bedroom. Uh, but I've got an entire bookshelf now full. I think I could probably fit in three more movies at the very bottom. Wow, and that's it. So I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I, I think I own roughly of the five hundred and like seventy or eighty. I probably roughly own four hundred of them at this rate. Maybe a little less, but either way, it's still quite a bit. Um, and but, and you're still going for any format on those, right? For the most part, yeah. If it's or newer DVD, stuff, DVD or above, at least. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for like newer things, I'm of course going Blu-ray or 4K. So like my most recent ones, I've got Tar and oh my god, their green screen's freaking out. But Tar and everything really else. <laughs> uh, those are my newest ones that I added. Just the other day, so um, I'm trying to find out what's going on with that release of Tar. I think it's just because of the whole Oscar fever, but it is a little difficult to track down for some people. Really? Like uh, Target has some copies in, but they're very expensive, like forty dollars okay. just for a Studio 4K type of expensive, really? wow. which is pretty crazy. Well, this um, was just the Blu-ray, which I was okay with because the movie was very good, but I don't, I don't know if I necessarily needed it on the 4K. Right, and I've got many thoughts about everything, everywhere, all at once. But I, I, I went all out and got the 4K on that one as well. So good. Uh, we have a whole bunch of comments already, and I, Josephine, I gotta say, I love when I come on here and you've got a bunch of comments waiting. This is always fun. I uh, just finished watch or reading The Outsiders, and then uh, watched the movie today. Thoughts on The Outsiders book and movie? John even prepared and grabbed something off the yes. shelf to share for this. And the green screen's gonna freak out. So let me. Uh... <laughs> Let me turn that off. How about for a second here? Oh, the bedroom's not even that bad. Oh, it's not terrible. And you can still see my stuff in the background. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is that Studio Canal release of The Outsiders. Uh, it's a solid release. Yeah, this thing is insane. So highly, highly recommend this one. Uh, my mom's watching, and she uh, taught The Outsiders for many, 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 many years to her seventh graders. Nice. So I know she's going to be very happy that we're starting off with this conversation right now. Nice. Um, yeah, great book. Uh, I love the movie. I, I don't know, just it's a classic, you know, classic Coppola. I am not sure if I've ever read the book. I feel like I must have, but I, I, I don't know. If I did read it, it is gone in the passage of time. I do love the movie. Seen it many, many times. I probably need to watch it again. I've not watched that newest 4K yet, and my wife needs to see it again. She saw it many times ago, uh, yeah. many years ago. Rumblefish, of course. Uh, I've not read Rumblefish, but I've seen Rumblefish. Rumblefish is great. What about you? Are you a Rumblefish person? I've actually never seen it. I do have it. Oh, it's one of those I do own, and another one that my mom it wasn't in her curriculum, I don't think ever. At least it wasn't when I was being taught by her. Um, 
but I know she really enjoyed it. She really likes S.E. Hinton as well. Um, nice. But yeah, so Outsiders definitely is where it's at. Yeah, Outsiders is good. Uh, Rumblefish, I think at this age, I might prefer Rumblefish a little bit more. Um, I also, I love this question, so we're going to highlight this one, and then we'll keep going. Yeah. Uh, which David Lynch film would you like to see thir- turned into a theme park ride? Okay, well, the obvious one is Straight Story, because why, no. why would you go on a, on a uh, it could be like a, you're on a, a lawnmower going around like a little track. <laughs> like, it's, like, it's like a kitty, kitty roller coaster, but you're on, it just goes around a circle, how about? No, uh, let's see, realistically, though, uh, do like a really scary roller coaster of Lost Highway. <laughs> yeah, it could be fun. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, take Space Mountain to make it Lost Highway themed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that. I, I think the best answer for this, though, is you have to do Twin Peaks. And right before you, uh, like, you get in the line and they hand you a tab of LSD. And then the line is a minimum 30 minute wait. And the moment that you get into the building, nothing is as it seems. And it's like, it's like the haunted mansion, but it's uh, fully interactive and they beat the absolute crap out of you. Oh, if you went to a haunted house of the, the Palmer house, that's there yeah. it is. Oh my there God. it is. Uh, all right. We are going to get into our announcements and uh, obviously based on the, the David Lynch question, you can see we're talking about Lynch tonight. Uh, John yeah. has a kind of a, a personal story with David Lynch. We're going to be talking about that before we head into it. And, um yeah any any questions that come up during this uh by all means uh leave a comment we will try to get to as many as we possibly can if you want to highlight it the uh super chat and all that is there but in the meantime let's get into some of these which this last week we started with the vinegar syndrome sale last thursday night as part of our live show figured we should probably do a little recap on that uh vinegar syndrome i know that you had not been super deep into them but over the last uh year year and a half it seems like you've gotten a little more closer with them how's uh how's that relationship bloomed in your eyes uh i mean it, i get stuff sparingly uh, right enough. i i'm i'm i mostly focus every month if i see something come out uh that's been featured on red letter media's best of the worst i immediately it's an instant pickup uh what was their last when did they do their last big announcements was that just last month like the when with the clue documentary was that just last month uh, that was just 15 days ago. Okay, so I immediately got that one as well. Like that's that was a day one pickup, and that sold out fast. Yeah, which that's what's really quick. Um, but I, I mean, they're amazing. I, I really do. Even if I don't pick up all their stuff all the time, I love their work. Uh, they put so much effort and heart into their releases. Yeah. Um, those slips are amazing. Um, I, it's just always they're they're a great gem. Absolutely. I agree. And I think it's really cool that they're doing things like uh, this month they announced that subscribers are getting a special gift for BioZombie uh, in their package. And uh, spoilers, if you don't want to hear what it is, I don't have a picture of it ready. But uh, if you are not wanting to hear about it and you're just wanting to be surprised when you open your box, mute it for 10 seconds. Um, But they are doing this really cool uh, hard box that is like the slip case that they've done for some of their things where the slip cover will go into the hard box and it looks incredible it looks like the uh the recent i think it was 101 films that did the release of johnny mnemonic it's got that same kind of art style on the outside and i can't wait to see that in the hand it looks amazing um so yeah last week we had the start of the uh, February adult sale for them. And one of the things that they did is they released Massage Parlor Murders on 4K. Uh, nice looking slip here. It's not my favorite film from them, but it's one that, uh, you know, I, I can see them doing 4K for a reason. It's their 10 year anniversary. This was one of their first titles out. So yeah, uh, not, not, not really surprised with this one. Mm-hmm. But then um, we got some of the uh, Picarama titles. We got the double exposure of holly this is from 1976 nice slip on this one and uh this one sounds pretty good however i think the star of this month for their new stuff is this release of body girls and let's get physical this one looked pretty dang good uh directed by bob shin and uh starring hyapatia lee i believe is how you say your name and yeah this one looked actually pretty fun i'm kind of excited to get that one in 
Uh, then they gave us two of these catalog slip covers for A Woman's Torment, and her name was Lisa. Have you seen any of these uh, Picarama titles from them before? No, not at all. No. So, uh, A Woman's Torment is one that I will happily, happily recommend to everybody because it is uh, like an adult take on uh, Repulsion uh, from Plansky, and it's very, very well made. It is a very entertaining movie. Uh, but they also put out this really neat looking screen print that if you can't see the detail here, it is fantastic to celebrate their, uh, 10 year anniversary. And then that sold out immediately. So they actually released a couple more colorways that you could get with that one. Uh, nice. they finally put out a new hoodie to celebrate their anniversary, a nice 10 year anniversary shirt. Uh, then they got the logo shirt for the Valentine's sale a VHS of Hot and Saucy Pizza Girls, another one I will happily recommend to everybody. And then uh, Erotic Ventures of Candy and Candy Goes to Hollywood got a VHS release. And they even put out Vampire Hookers on VHS. Uh, everybody yeah. Needs, everybody needs a vampire hooker, clearly. I would fully agree. Uh, and that's it. Vinegar Syndrome had a, a decent sale. I think a lot of people uh, were a little disappointed that they weren't like having their socks blown off by everything that was announced, but it's an adult sale. It's not one of their two biggest sales of the year. So I was not at all there, surprised. There just was, well, obviously the Black Friday sale was the most recent big one, right? I mean, there wasn't really right. Big. Well, then, I mean, the first week of January was kind of a big deal this year too. Yeah, a 10 year, that was a 10 year. God, this whole year has been a blur, but yeah, that was a 10 year sale. So yeah, that was a huge thing. They weren't going to go all out on February again. So exactly. And that was only six weeks ago. I know, right? <laughs> Same. Uh, let's see. Uh, Josephine says Andrew and Steven discussed some Picarama titles on their latest episode of Chasing Labels. That is fantastic. I love those guys. We're going to be talking about Steven in just a little bit, obviously. Uh, they mentioned that in the 80s, aerobics was a turn on for men, <laughs> thus making way for aerobic exploitation. Fantastic. Uh, let's... What's, the, what's the one movie? It's uh, Is it Jamie Lee Curtis and John Travolta? What movie is that? The, that's oh, like big aerobics. yes. Uh, that was Google just without announced, to... I think. Google real fast. Yeah, I don't remember what that uh, title is, but yeah, I feel like that just got announced. Um, speaking of announcements, we're going to go past Vinegar Syndrome and find out that we are getting Terminal Invasion from Kino Lorber on April 25th. This is a uh, TV movie starring Bruce Campbell. Um, It's directed by Sean Cunningham, which is pretty yeah. dang cool. The names stand out, but when I look it up, it looks like garbage. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't look great. Right. You know, Antoine gave the answer to staying alive. Oh, was, wait, or was it hard bodies? I don't know. Uh, Perfect. I have no idea. I can look it up. We there's got a Google. whole bunch of answers. I thought it was staying alive. The, the chat can be, <laughs> yeah, I can get it. Tom got it. Okay, so yeah, it must be perfect. Thank you, Tom. Uh, let's keep going here. Uh, next Saigon from 1948 is getting a Kino release. This is another one where we don't have the release date, but, uh, this looks like a solid release. They got a 2k scan of the 35 millimeter fine grain. It's a new master. And, uh, this is the Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake title. This one seems like it's up your alley. Have you seen Saigon before? I haven't. I'd never heard of it either. Uh, I am aware of Veronica Lake. Um, but no, this is one of those older titles I just don't know of. <laughs> Love Josephine's comment here. Uh, Bruce Campbell said about his movie Mind Warp, the only good thing about that movie was that I met my lovely wife. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's what I must be thinking of. The most recent announcement wasn't uh, Jamie Lee. It was Travolta and Kelly Preston. Mm, okay. Have either of you seen Running Time? Genuinely great dramatic performance from Campbell. I have. That got a fairly recent release from uh, Synapse. Have you seen Running Time? No, I haven't. I feel bad. There's probably going to be a lot of movies here that you're going to say, have you seen it? And I haven't. But No, there's, uh, there's tons of these that I haven't no. seen either. Don't worry about that. Uh, let's head to the next one, which is Force of Evil, which uh, I'm going to ask again if you've seen it, because this one is a pretty big title. No Force of Evil. <laughs> So this is another one from 1948, and Kino is putting this out soon. We got uh, the other master that was used on this previously. It's a 4K scan of the 35 millimeter fine grain by Paramount with UCLA helping them. Uh, this is the John Garfield uh, Marine Windsor, Thomas Gomez, B. 
Beatrice Pearson film that uh, has gotten quite a few releases and it's getting another release as well. Wow, Stan has running time on VHS. That's awesome. <laughs> that's a pretty cool one to have. That's I'm sure that's pretty rare at this point. <clears throat> Uh, I put up an interview with Frank Jang, who is the master of remaster earlier this week. And uh, somebody that is associated with Frank is uh, Will Gish, who is the Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society aficionado, I guess, the founder, whatever we want to call him. Uh, we got a conversation with him going up on the channel tomorrow. So if you want to have a little companion piece to Frank, make sure you check that out. And uh, yeah, it's a good one. Uh, next up, Kino Lorber on April 18th is putting out Lady in a Jam from 1942. This one has a new commentary with Alan Arkush and Daniel Kramer on it. Uh, anything interesting about this one? I know you said you looked up some of the titles. Uh, I, I looked this one up, uh, and the only thing I really looked up was the director, which was, it says, uh, Gregory, excuse me, Gregory LaCava. Yep. Um, I, have, I have seen one of his movies. It was uh, My Man Godfrey. Oh, that's, nice, uh, yeah. That's an obvious major classic uh screwball comedy so yeah um you have to imagine that this is probably decent too um, i would hope so and uh they're they're saying this is another classic screwball so i will probably enjoy this one uh next up we finally got some details on some of the other classic warner titles that are coming out this year uh rebel without a cause from 1955 is coming out on 4k in a steelbook version and also in a slipcase version, uh, I got to say, I do not love this Warner Brothers 100 branding that they're leading with on all these. I hate when studios pick something like this and run with I, it. Yeah, I don't like I don't like the tops of that either. And even when I was looking at like going back to like tar, like obviously that's the norm nowadays. I, I just don't right. like it. It looks terrible. I don't want the movies anywhere thing here. You know, that's the same thing like with this Warner release. It just I get why they do it. I, I wish I had one near me, but I, I enjoy the way that uh, Lionsgate does it. Usually it blends in with the art a little bit at the top. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. I don't know if I have any off top. Here. Sibner says they've already confirmed that's a J card. Oh, okay. Over a slip cover though. That would be, that would be interesting. I throw those out. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we should almost remove you from the the channel for that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this all, all is the arrow releases. All those all those cards, garbage. <laughs> Gone, Gonzo. Uh, people genuinely buy those, so maybe you should keep a keep a hold of some of them. Maybe. Uh, this is getting uh, some special features. I don't think it's everything that has been out on these before, but it's uh, it's a solid looking release. It's getting that Best Buy Steelbook, like I shared. Um, we got, I believe, four of these classics from Warner coming in between April and May. This is coming on April 18th. And then one more. On April 4th, we are getting Cool Hand Luke in 4K. And it is also getting a steelbook. This is that one, which uh, this is decent. And yes, this Warner yeah. 100 is clearly a J card. Mm -hmm. But I don't know about this one on the slip. I think that might just be a part of the slip cover. Yeah. That would be really interesting. It definitely looks like it based on what you're showing here. Yeah. Uh, so this one is going to have the commentary by Eric Lax, a documentary, which is uh, a making of and then a trailer on it. It's Cool Hand Luke, uh, Paul Newman, obviously a great, uh, a lot of people have seen this one, but we're getting it on 4K. Not which me, is unfortunately. I, 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 I know. I, I'm sorry. There, there's, there's plenty of. I go back a page. I haven't seen Rebel Without a Cause either. So, <laughs> any James Dean. I would say I haven't seen any Paul Newman, but that's a lie because I just watched. Um, I did back to back. I did The Sting and I did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Are so, those the only two? I'm of the verdict. Um, I'm sure there's a couple, a couple other ones. Newman but. has made some genuine greats, and even like his understated uh, films, like he did. Oh gosh, uh, what was that one? Somebody in the chat helped me out here. He the it was put out on imprint, and Kino is also releasing it. Uh, nobody's fool. That's I've the not one. Seen the, title the title, yeah. It is very well done, and it's a it's like a classic old person movie for uh, Paul because he's on the older side in that movie. But he yeah. he is so good in that movie. Um, and and on my watch list coming up soon is uh, 
his directorial, Rachel, Rachel. I'm going to be watching that one sometime in the next probably week here because I'm on my best picture I, journey. I but... forgot that Paul Newman is in cars. <laughs> oh, God, you're right. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, oh, thoughts on Road to Perdition? I like Road uh, Road to Perdition. I think it's a very good movie. I think it's easily one of his ten best. Uh, let's see. I yeah, completely agree. More excited about these than the the ridiculous box sets that they're doing. However, I just hope they do them right because Warner they're not quite as bad as Paramount at their four Ks, but it could be it could be a little on the rough side sometimes. So yeah. The Hustler, that's another great Newman. Coming soon, I'll watch it soon. HUD is also a great Newman performance. And uh, this is such a long title, but the effect of gamma rays on Man in the Moon Marigolds is great too. Paul Newman directed that one. Uh, Let's see, what is next? All these Paul Newman movies I haven't seen. My goodness. (laughs) Uh, Here's another classic, The maltese falcon this one is coming out april 18th as well this will also have a best buy steelbook but there was no super good quality picture of that one yet uh the pre-order for that should be up fairly soon if it's not already this was posted a couple days ago uh again loaded with lots of special features but none of them are new i don't think uh i'm hoping that we we get something more eventually but uh, probably raise, not. they couldn't raise humphrey bogart from the dead and do a commentary track? Not this time. Uh, yes, we absolutely will be, Sibner. It's a, it's a mess. And in fact, I think they might be next after this. Can't wait to talk about them. So <laughs> another coming up. Uh, Cheers is getting a complete series box set from Paramount on April 25th. This one is odd because I am a little bit worried that they might do the, uh, the same route that they did with Charmed. And uh, many of those discs were mod discs oh, and okay. yeah they were a lot lower quality than they should have been and with a big box set like this there is potential for them to cheap out a little bit but it's yeah. also cheers it's also like one of the most successful famous tv shows of all time right so i don't know i love cheers did you watch cheers a lot <sighs> no and i was about to say usually that was the time like like a rerun when the theme would come on, we changed the channel, but I was getting that confused for some reason with Coach. Oh, Coach was pretty good too. <laughs> Every time Coach came on, you'd hear the music and I instantly change the channel. I was like, you know, four. Ooh, the Hobbit. I think that's a little bit of a hot take. Cheers is good, but it's definitely not better than Seinfeld. I have, John, I, I have no uh, say on that. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, dude. I, I know you're younger than me. It's okay. We'll <laughs> let that pass. Not by much, but yeah. All I right. Like the uh, if we're if we're tying it all into David Lynch tonight, I do like there is a uh, I don't know if it's just a TikTok account, but it's called Sign Peaks. And what they do is they take Seinfeld clips, they remove the laugh track from it, and they put a uh, Twin Peaks score over it, and it heightens it so much better. It makes it such, <laughs> it's, just, it's it's incredible. So I highly yes. recommend everybody check it out. That's fantastic. Uh, So last week we talked about the volume four of the Warner Brothers Blu-ray sets. And uh, now we're going to get into volumes one, two, and three. And just what a mess these are. So April 4th. Yeah, yeah. April 4th, we're getting volume one, which is award winners featuring Grand Hotel, Mutiny on the Bounty, Adventures of Robin Hood, Mrs. Miniver, Casablanca, Key Largo, Streetcar Named Desire, Ben Hur, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Bonnie and Clyde, Cool Hand Luke, Bullet, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Purple Rain, The Color Purple, Unforgiven, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, Mystic River, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Million Dollar Baby, The Departed, Argo, A Star is Born, and Judas and the Black Messiah. That's a really stacked box, though. I'm not going to lie. Like, that's a lot of good stuff in there. The... The titles are good. Mm-hmm. Why are they giving us this box set that is Blu-ray, that they're not doing anything new to any of the discs, yeah. repackaging this and getting, you know, getting this on a shelf? I, I, like, Be- who does this appeal to? Because they know suckers like us will get them in this chat. Uh, but- I don't think many <laughs> in the chat are going to buy this. Actually. I, I'm kidding. But the thing is, yeah, the titles are great, but when it's just 
a box set, like you said, of just repurposed stuff, I, I steer clear of it. I mean, like, it's good if you don't own those, but I don't, and I've never seen them, but like, I don't know. I just. Well, many of these are also on 4K mm -hmm. and you're putting it out on a Blu ray disc. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I thought one of these was a 4K box set. Did I misread that wrong? No, they are doing one 4K box set, but okay, the, all the was, ones this week are all the Blu rays. Okay, that's where I was confused on. Okay. Because that was last week that they announced that 4K set, wasn't it? it either last week or the week before. They've been tapering these out like crazy. Yeah. Um, but yes, this is hilarious to me. So they're including two of the Lord of the Rings films and not the Fellowship of the Ring. They are including, uh, let's see, what was the other wild one here to me? Oh, it might be in the next one. Um, but yeah, just some odd choices. Like, to go from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to Purple Rain to The Color Purple to Unforgiven, and then to jump to 2002, and that's all that they had yeah, from no 1975 thing. to 2002, that's insanity. Yeah, and when you look at it closer, you're right. Like, I wouldn't, I don't know, looking at it one more time, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Silent Mandible says Fellowship is DLC. <laughs> yeah, at this rate. Exactly. Yeah, Fellowship is another set. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, yes, Stan, I, I think you and I and many others in the chat are on the same page here. Uh, let's take a closer look at some of this. Uh, here is the close-up of the actual box and then what we are getting. The, the whole limited side of this, we are getting commemorative packaging collectible warner brothers shield pins uh i think there's two yeah two pins that you can see on the bottom here it's just the warner brothers logo and then the 100 logo that they're using i want everybody and, to know when i wear that that i am a warner brothers corporate shill <laughs> use so. that as a tie clip or something yeah exactly uh and then a 28 page booklet filled with original posters production notes and behind the scenes photos which means all of these movies are jam-packed into 28 pages and if you listen to what they just said was in there, it's mostly just pictures. Yeah. That you can find on the internet right now. I think DC, his comment here is probably it. Yep. Uh... <laughs> Dylan Smith, if Warner Brothers wants our attention, put this out on VHS. Hell yeah, I'd uh, buy it. On hell VHS. no, I want this on LaserDisc. I want this on a 25 LaserDisc set. <laughs> said <laughs> mm -hmm. uh but then we have volume two which is comedies dramas and musicals and uh this one has 42nd street the wizard of oz citizen kane singing in the rain a star is born 1954 rebel without a cause dr Zhivago, the outsiders risky business gremlins the goonies little shop of horrors both cuts they needed to make sure to tell you that for little shop uh, Empire of the Sun, The Bodyguard, Dumb and Dumber, Friday, Boogie Nights, Selena, Practical Magic, The Iron Giant, Elf, Hairspray, The Hangover, Invictus, okay. Invictus, oh, yeah, and uh, right. Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah, this is one It's like great, 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 great uh, quality. It's like, okay, like they're I... fine movies. Don't get me wrong. Like every, everything here is okay. As it gets closer to the end, like it's uh, okay, but it's an odd mix. <laughs> I would the Mandible wants it on Microfish. <laughs> Hell yeah. I would never expect a box set to have Citizen Kane and The Hangover in the same. Citizen Kane, The Hangover, and Elf. Yeah. Come on. Like, this is this is a wild set. And once uh, again, you're talking about the... Sorry to interrupt you, but just jumping the gun on the ears. Look at that. It goes from 1954, Star is Born, Rebel Without a Cause, 55... You skip 10 years to Dr. Shivago, and then you skip 20 years to The Outsiders and Risky Business. Yeah, that's that's embarrassing. And it's Warner Brothers, yeah. like one of the, the four biggest studios ever. Yeah. And this is what they put up. Yeah, I mean, again, it's for those that have never seen these. They just want a complete box set. They care about space. I don't know. Paul, my copy and paste did not get that very well. I apologize. Iron Giant says it came out in 1909. <laughs> Uh, the character recognition in, in uh, photos is not 100% yet. Mm -hmm. uh, volume 3. Oh, this God. is where it gets uh, even sillier, I, I, I think, because yeah, they start in 1978. Like, uh, 
Uh, this is Volume 3, Fantasy, Action, and Adventure. Superman, Never-Ending Story, Supergirl, Lethal Weapon, Batman, Twister, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Ocean's Eleven, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, there it is, Constantine, V for Vendetta, Pan's Labyrinth, 300, The Dark Knight, Man of Steel, Mad Max Fury Road, Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them, Wonder Woman, Justice League, Aquaman, Shazam, Joker, Birds of Prey, The Suicide Squad, and Black Anthem. This is like 70% DC. This sucks. I'm just saying it. This is a bad box set. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony says Batman 89. Time to throw out my 4K. <laughs> no, it's half half DC like and half new DC, which isn't very critically acclaimed. You know. I'm I'm gonna get this just for black out. And it has like okay, Supergirl's not very, you know good either <laughs> so. right i'm shocked that that's coming out at all as part of this let's see john says just give us the goddamn devils already yes i think it is absolute crap that they put the devils in space jam new legacy <laughs> they won't put that out on blu-ray <laughs> or any any form it's a good call good call uh Harry Potter in 2023, the WB celebration is canceled. Uh, you know what's odd, too? I think it's kind of odd. Obviously, they had to do it because it's the studios and it makes sense. But it is kind of odd that Warner Brothers and Disney are doing the 100-year celebration at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I I got to imagine there's a little bit of competition going on there, quite a bit, I'm even though Disney it. owns everything under the sun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> fantasy and adventure didn't exist before 1978. No, it didn't actually. That's, do they separate? Uh, do they have separate packaging inside at least? No. I mean, this is where it gets really bad. If you can see, it's just these little envelopes for the discs. And Dang. it's it's in those uh, little book pages. And I hate these types of releases. That's Absolutely hate them. The only times that I think something like this works is with Severn sets. Severn absolutely kills it with their packages. Like this is the uh, the Andy Milligan set, and yeah, they come in the books, but they're the side loaders, and they are easily accessible, and it's light, and it's this is an, a director's full filmography that's available, and it is in this easy thing that we can access on our shelf, and it holds in one small package, and yet Criterion will give us. You know, the, the Godzilla box set that oh, takes up half of a coffee table. And those discs are hard to get out to. Like, I need to just get the the, the makeshift boxes for those. You know, the, the custom box for the those. The custom ones, yeah. I just need to get them. I, I've been trudging my feet ever since that box came out. John, you shut your mouth. Constantine is way better than most of these DC films. Come on. Uh, let's see. Oh, I guess I should probably zoom out here. Uh, next up is finally no more WB. Uh, Oscilloscope had a sale for Valentine's Day. Their sales are always great, but they're over very quickly. So make sure you follow close for those. Can you real quick explain? I, I clicked on that and I didn't go through it any further. What was the point of Silence of the Lambs with it? Was it just it, was there any uh, sort of tie-in? Like, obviously, they're not going to release that, but... It was literally just the anniversary of the film, and okay. instead of making it about Valentine's Day, they made it about something that is relevant okay. to film. Okay, I was very confused. I was like, I, I don't know what the correlation is here, so... But, thank you. Dark Sage says, you know what they should do for a 100th anniversary? Have a show where all the Batman show up and say, I'm Batman, compete to see who's better. Uh, I... Go ahead. I, all I was going to say is, if Kevin Conroy was still alive... I would almost be okay with that. But then what I was going to say was, have you seen the trailer for the Flash movie? I mean, <laughs> you're just describing that right there. Like, it's going to happen. So. This is true. Uh, all right, we got two releases for House of a Thousand Corpses coming out. Uh, Rob Zombie's film is getting a new steelbook and a interesting little almost box set that is a limited edition box set. Uh, the, the crazy thing is that this is not just re-releasing the disc. It's it's not going to be in 4K, which a lot of people are a little bit unhappy about. But uh, they did get more features on here, which is something that a lot of people thought would never exist at all. 
Uh, this is getting cast and director interviews from many of the people involved. Some uh, behind the scenes sets. Uh, we got, let's see, five on set behind the scenes segments. They are Dr. Satan test, professor test, electronic press kit. Uh, yeah, uh, so, some other cool stuff on here. And then if you get the digital copy, there's also a new director's commentary, mm. which uh, is interesting. I actually really like this movie. Have you seen this one? I'm not big on it, but yeah, I've seen it. Um, when did I watch it? I think I watched it. I don't remember. I couldn't remember if it was in preparation for Crypticon a couple years ago when Sid Haig was there. Yep. And Bill Mosley was there. I think I watched it in preparation for that. Uh, again, I wasn't like big on it, but um, I think it was because Captain Spaulding is not in it as much, and he was yeah. the best part of it. That intro is absolutely great, yep, um, and extremely memorable. But I I struggle with Rob Zombie's film work. I guess I don't know, but I'm a I'm an apologist. I I don't think his stuff is always bad. I think some of the uh, I think some of his dialogue is pretty bad, and it, I don't know. You just kind of got to be ready for that style when you go into it. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's the important part. And I feel bad. I, I never finished Devil's Rejects, uh, but I love the ending to it, if that makes any sense. The free bird ending. Right, but you never finished it, but you know I the never ending. Finished right? it. I've seen the ending, but I've never, <laughs> I didn't finish the movie. Um, but that ending it is a great it, ending. It's a great ending, yeah. Uh, so let's see. There was a comment I was going to highlight, and uh, oh, uh, Sibner said this is strange to put out after they had a Steelbook trilogy put out. Yes and no. Like I don't think any of Zombies films are going to get a good catalog 4K release anymore. However, they did have the standalone uh, Steelbook for the third film. So to put this out, it's not very surprising because I bet Devil's Rejects will probably get a Lionsgate Steelbook within the next year and a half now. Probably. Let's see. Uh, Simoner says, I think he's directing in the wrong decade. That, and instead of the Halloween remake, he should have been the one to direct the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake in 2003. He would have absolutely killed that movie. Mm -hmm. So one thing I always like about Rob Zombie, though, in general, uh, is his love for old classic horror so that comment almost does ring true. He probably would have directed really well a long time ago. Yeah, I, I guarantee so he would have been great that. in the, the golden age of exploitation. Not only in his films and his music. like I always think his music videos, like like the Dragula video, uh, yep. Living Dead Girl, that's Caligari. Like, yep. I think it's great. I, I love that about him. Even if I don't like his work, I do appreciate it about him. Stan Giese has stories to tell about Bill Mosley. Stan was a... Stan was involved with some stuff back in the day that we're going to be talking about here soon. Uh, let's see. Next up is some new Sandpiper Pictures uh, releases, which are an interesting eclectic mix this time. We get The Quiet American from 1958 and then Year of the Comet from 1992. And uh, we, we finish it up with the modern classic of Bulletproof Monk with Chow Yun-Fat and Sean William Scott from 2003. Uh, the three of these are coming out on April 18th and oh man, uh, Sandpiper. I'm not sure what to think yet. This is the olive films. Yep. Like branch. Off. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bulletproof monk. Uh, obviously never saw it, but as a kid, when it came out, uh, I remember seeing all the advertisements everywhere and I always found it so strange that Stifler would be in a like action movie starring Chow Yun fat. I always thought that was kind of odd. Um, it just didn't seem like it worked, but I I can't tell you anything about the movie. Otherwise, I, I don't know. <laughs> Love it. Uh, another steel book that is coming out. Uh, also, and it's only Blu-ray. This is coming out exclusively to Walmart from Mill Creek on April 18th. This is the 2011 release of The Thing. This is the prequel to the John Carpenter film. And this is, again, not just a repackaging. This is a an actual new disc where we are getting new features on this uh, with uh, some some interesting things. We got some new featurettes called Who Goes There and What Goes There. And uh, yeah, we got a commentary in this and all the same features that were on the original release. So it actually looks like a decent release. And I don't hate this movie. I think it's it's a decent prequel. Again, 
I just haven't. It, it sits on my shelf waiting for me to watch it, but it's like, uh, I'd rather just watch the Carpenter one. Like, you know. Yes, but uh, it's a part of that world. It's a right. prequel. It's I'll, I'll a get to it eventually. Uh, as all my all my things on my shelf that are sitting there unwashed, I'll get to it eventually. Yeah. Uh, Paul says, Chow Yun Fat deserved a better American run. Absolutely. Uh, Sibner, aren't they also adopting a lot of the former Twilight Time titles? Yes, they are. Yes, they are, thankfully. I would love it if we can get more of those out. Um, like, again, on this journey of collecting the best picture stuff, there's a lot of really underseen ones that Twilight Time put out, and I'm not spending the money to get some of those. Exactly. But it'd be nice if they could get re-released through some of these. Uh, a go-to example is Bob Fosse's Lenny. That Blu-ray is mega expensive. Yep. It has a DVD. I can't find the DVD anywhere. I could buy it on eBay. But god dang it, if somebody could just send it out or put it out now, like I'm instantly I, buying it. You know, I would not be surprised if Sam Piper gets to it eventually. Uh, Paul says if they released the thing from 2011 with the CGI scrubbed out and the practical effects put in, I'd buy it. The hard part is that doesn't exist. They they did not film the entire thing with practical effects and then just scrub over it with CGI. They stopped before they completed the film. So uh, they, they saw that it was going to be too expensive and they did it with CGI. It just it doesn't exist. Um, but Stan yeah. Giese, he enjoyed the prequel and I'm glad. Let's go to the next one. Not a whole lot left already. Uh, April 18th from Kino. You and me from 1938. This gets a new commentary by Simon Abrams, who has done uh, some stuff recently. And uh, yeah, I don't know anything about this one either. I'm, I'm sure that this is a miss for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the thing is, when it when the title or the opening sentence says one of the earliest and quirkiest Hollywood ventures, and it's by Fritz yeah. Long, you don't you wouldn't think he'd be quirky because he's yep. very serious. So I don't know. I know nothing. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. Uh, Shop Factory is having their Love is in the Scare sale right now, and some of the titles are decently priced. It's nowhere near as good as the sale was in October, but uh, some of them, if you're if you're in the looking, this is a good time to buy something, so check it out. I looked through there like I normally do. Obviously, I didn't buy anything, but I had to look through just in case. There was something yeah. that was like priced at a steal, but... Standard pricing, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, reminder that Erica Schultz from Unsung Horrors, her book is ending the Indiegogo run this weekend. When this was posted a couple days ago, there were six days left. I believe it ends on Sunday morning or Saturday night. So we're getting very close. If you have not picked up yours yet, it is looking to be uh, an incredible book. And just a reminder to everybody to check it out. It is completely worth it. I've uh, I've seen you repost a bunch of clips, I think, over the last couple weeks on your Instagram of, like, from this, of, like, yeah. children deaths. You have to laugh. Like, you can't just, <laughs> you know. Uh, I feel like we had this conversation last year, or maybe when they announced it. But either way, it was uh, a, a go-to example for this was Beware Children at Play. Yes. Yeah. still have yet to pick up, because that's got all the kid deaths at the end of it because yep. they actually go through with it. But yeah. Uh, you made cam look up Lenny on eBay and it's $170 at the moment. Yes. I'm, I'm not spending that. I wish KB what's going on listening more than watching. Cause Oh no, slipped on the ice. Oof. Are you all right? Holy hell. That sucks. It, yeah, it was not great in Kansas city today. I it was, Sorry, I woke up and I looked out the window. I'm like, I thought it was supposed to snow and it looks like nothing out there. And then I hear about all this ice. I haven't been out today, but we uh not not to be a downer, but one of the uh high school teachers in my town here uh died in a car wreck today because of the icy conditions. Yeah. That's scary. Oof. Uh anyone read Peter Watts The Things, which retells the Carpenter narrative from the Things perspective. That sounds super interesting. A long time ago. I don't remember hardly anything about it, but yes, I have read that. But a long, long time ago. <laughs> Dead Sea Life says it was 65 in New York. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, last night, last night was fun. Uh, I'm going to spend a second on this one because last night was wild. Uh, we had Brad Henderson and Ryan, 
uh, Grave Fra- Grave Face from Terravision on here, and uh, it was it was an interesting interesting night. W- was last night the night you were in here? Was that on Tuesday? I was uh, I was in on Tuesday, but I, w- I I was listening. I was lurking last night as well. Last night was so much fun. If you guys have not given uh, the the interview from last night a chance, please give it a moment. Um, some some very interesting details. Uh, the fact that they were so transparent about um, the the departure from OCN, the motivation behind what films they put out, uh, the fact that we got an exclusive at the end of the chat, and uh, I'm not even going to reveal it here, just so everybody can go and uh, give it a watch just in case. But um, yeah, th- we are the only place that they've revealed that that uh, title is coming. So make sure that you give it give it an opportunity and, and a listen. It was really funny and a really good time and. I, I hope people liked it because it's 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 a good chat and Brad and Ryan they know their shit like well, for I, everything. I missed the ending of it. I think I was there for about the first hour, um, so I'll, we'll have to go back and listen to see what this exclusive is. See what it, was, it was, was only title? almost three hours long. <laughs> I assume it was a title announcement of some sort. Yes, they did reveal right. a title. All righty, I uh, I picked up Santa Claus from them because again that was on Best of the Worst. Uh, not a great movie, but it was it was a watch, I guess. You know, it's from Best of the Worst. That's that's you know, exactly what you expect, I'm sure. John Russo directed. Did well, you know, oh, I was gonna tease. Did you know John Russo worked on Night of the Living Dead with George A. Romero? That's awesome. Did you know that? I don't think I did. If you didn't watch Santa Claus, and you'll <laughs> see the poster on almost every single shot of that movie. So. Uh, Santa Claus looks very good for being uh, shot on 16 mil. It it is a a nice restoration. I did pop it in to take a look at that. Um, yeah, it, it was a good time last night. Let's see, Wave is here. What's going on? Uh, Anthony says last night was absolutely amazing, insightful, and hilarious. Uh, we ended up the night with calling uh, Ryan from Terrorvision the mayor of Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> yes, Ryan is quite the entrepreneur. Dude, dude has seven locations, a museum, opening a mall location. It was a good time. That's nuts. All right, here is John's bread and butter. We got some Criterion announcements, and uh, this happened in uh, an interesting period for what they announced. We got a 4K coming of Wings of Desire. This uh, notably does not have any HDR. It is just the 4K disc, no new features. Um, I'm sure I know what you're going to say, but what do you think about Criterion with their version of re-releasing things on 4K recently? Well, it's like it's like any of the companies. I wish they would do it just less often. If they do one a month, maybe, okay, that's fine. Two, you're kind of pushing it, especially on some of these titles, because some of these titles, I'm like, I don't, I don't care. My eyes are terrible, so half the time I can't tell the difference between 4K and Blu-ray anyway. Um, but, like, I just feel like some of the titles they put these out for, it's like, I okay, like, all right, all right I don't know. Um, but I'll be content with my Blu-ray. Uh, I, once again, I've not seen this. I love Paris, Texas, though. Yeah. So I feel like I'm going to like anything that Vendors puts out. Um, so... I'm not going to upgrade this, but I'm anxious to finally get around watching it. My my feeling on this, which I don't know if I said this like this last month when we discussed it, because we discuss it every month. It feels like mm-hmm. uh, it 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 would make me just as I don't know, like I don't know the right way to say it, because I'm not like unhappy that they're doing it. I just wish that it wasn't replacing other titles because the way Criterion has always done it, there is basically one title for every week of the month. You can count on that like clockwork, basically. If you were to be doing 4K upgrades, I don't care if you do two or three every month, but put it in addition to the titles that we were already getting. Nice. Now, I I, I also got to give them some slack a little bit because I know that they've had a rough couple of years and that they've had to cut some people and... Um, yeah, and there there, there's so been some issues late into the game. I remember, oh man, I remember when the uh 4K announcements finally came out. You guys on here really going deep on that, but um, I don't know. Like I said, yeah, I, I wish they would do it in addition. You're right, because they usually put out about five every month, 
And if they do three plus the two, it's like, okay, well, that's not fun anymore. Yeah. Uh, are they're not as bad as like Shout Factory is doing right now? This they're going a little overboard. Um, because once again, I'm in the camp of like, does that really need to be in 4K? I mean, it's it's perfectly fine the way it is, but what do I know, right? <laughs> My eyes are terrible. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I will stand by the fact that I do think every single movie should be preserved and released in the highest quality possible. So I have nothing against that necessarily. Sure. However, I, we, we still have so many titles not on Blu-ray, so many titles that have never made it to DVD. Yeah. It's, that, it's and that's, that's again where I don't know. I'm sure we've talked about it before, but that's where I struggle with just 4K in general because it's like... I don't know. Like we're just, it's still such a niche market. And and I think people still struggle to realize that, that the 4k market is still so tiny that not everything needs to put out with that. And then, yeah, we need, they should try to focus efforts on other things first. We can still slowly get things in, but yeah, I don't know. It, it's tough. I guess that's why I'm not a, a corporate member of a Blu-ray company. Right, and the sad thing is, I it's not quite as niche as it was. Uh, people are demanding pretty much everything on 4K now, which sucks because that that's not going to happen. It's not realistic. Right. the The difference between a a a 4K UHD restoration and putting something out with a 2K scan, it's not just uh, you know a really simple thing to do. Um, if there's already a 4K scan from a studio, it's not as simple as choosing just to put it on right. a 4K disc. It is expensive. It is expensive as hell. So yeah. I, I don't know. It's, the discs are so expensive too. So that's another reason yeah. that I'm like, I can't, I can't justify buying 4K all the time. Uh, now on some of the boutique stuff that I have bought, and I've kind of slowed down a little bit. But depending on the title, I'll buy the 4Ks. Now on the Criterion, I've bought. I think oh, not, I would. I would say most of their 4Ks. I'm still behind on a few of them, but. I don't know. I agree. Hey, I, Dylan, I would I would watch the hell out of a 28 Days Later 4K. <laughs> I absolutely would. Tying it in with Lynch. If they couldn't do it with Inland Empire, I don't know how they're going to do it with 28 Days Later. So uh, They'll make it work. Um, another re-release from Criterion. On May 9th, we are getting Branded to Kill. This is the uh, Sejun Suzuki title. Um, again, nothing new. No special features. Uh, I, I would be thrilled for them to do anything new with the 4Ks, but it seems like they have no interest in even attempting to do anything new for the 4Ks. I think it almost goes back to what you're saying: is everybody wants everything in 4K, so let's just let's just release stuff, right? Because they'll buy and it. You know? The hard part, and I said this, I think I might have said this to Troy Howard this week. Uh, it it is hilarious that they're putting these out like this because, in all reality. It's Criterion. Most of the people that are contributing to these releases or have podcasts or YouTube channels or are uh, people that are trying to be film critics or what have you, many of them, many of them would be thrilled to do an audio commentary or a visual essay for Criterion. And yeah. most of them would do it for free for at least the first few. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have to do a damn thing. Just say, right. hey, try it out. If we don't like it, we're not even going to use it. You can get more content, uh, more content for these. Oh yeah, and like you said, even just one extra feature. Now, I'm not one of those that goes hard on the special features, but like, even just something to to make it worth that extra ten dollar upgrade. Right. Besides just the picture quality. I agree. Uh, by the way, Dylan, I was teasing. Obviously, 28 days later should not be in 4K. That's why I said the best quality possible. Um. However, this is pretty damn exciting. I'm looking uh, forward to this one. Criterion is releasing the 1968 uh, Peter Bogdanovich film Targets with Boris Karloff. Um, also, I don't know if everybody saw this because it wasn't posted as news necessarily, but uh, BFI is supposedly still releasing their release. Um, they they said that in a, I think it was in a comment on this, they are not they or they did not cancel their release. They just did not want to delay it like nine times until the elements were okay. So they just said, for now, it's off the schedule. 
and it is still coming supposedly and it will be cheaper than this and they did say something about there being different special features so i am very very excited that this is coming out and that means bfis will probably be coming out now before the end of the year yeah i uh i'm really looking forward i've heard of the title before uh but i did not really know anything about the movie but this is right up my alley i love the concept of it um the plot sounds great yeah uh, bogdanovich is good you got old karloff yeah sounds good for anybody that has never heard of what targets is this says uh this is produced by roger corman and this chillingly prescient vision of american-made carnage cast boris karloff as a version of himself an aging horror movie icon whose fate intersects with that of a seemingly ordinary young man on a psychotic shooting spree around Los Angeles. Charged with provocative ideas about the relationship between mass media and mass violence, Targets is a model of maximally effective filmmaking on a minimal budget and a potent first statement from one of the defining voices of the American New Wave. I mean... I, I know that I saw this years ago. I, I've i obviously never seen it in high definition. And I just cannot wait to see this in 2023 and yeah. see how it hits. I mean, the fact that this is, uh, God, what are we at, 55, yeah, 55 years old? And it's still, you know, it's still this this piece of cinematic history that is a very important big deal and is so, so, like gross to think about that the the this industry has been such a problem for so long i mean we say that the same week that we had another shooting that has made national headlines and um i don't know how many people saw some of the videos that are going around like there is there is somebody that was at michigan state that had went to sandy hook elementary and has now survived two of these mass shootings that made national headlines like that is terrifying that somebody is living this type of life um i don't know i i don't want to stand on a soapbox for too long but there's there's something going on here and obviously it's it's something that we need to fix but the movie looks fascinating i'm looking for that <laughs> i agree I, lo I love that era of uh that american new wave is like one of my all-time yeah. with a lot of people but absolutely love it yeah bogdanovich is great uh, this next one is one that I am pretty unhappy about. <laughs> uh, May 23rd, we are getting Petite Maman uh, from Criterion. And yes, this is the follow-up to a portrait of a lady on fire. And I'm glad that this is getting a release. Nothing against that. However, this is like a 69 or 70 minute movie or whatever like it is. 75 maybe. And sure. the only thing on here is a conversation between the director and Joaquin Trier. That's it. And they are charging a $40 MSRP for this. I Have people complained about it yet? Oh, yo, yeah. Okay. Well, the only reason why I ask is because there was their release of the Inland Sea. When they announced that, they did the same thing. They're like, we're doing the $40 charge. It's bare bones. There's nothing on it. Yep. And people complained, and then they, they lowered it down to the $30. So it's like... Okay, you know, but yeah, this probably should be a $30 one, $30 Blu-ray if it's that bare bones. Um, well, that, and again, it's only a 70-minute movie. Short, yeah. And they've released some other short movies, too, but at that normal price, but I imagine they're more stacked. Uh, Absolutely. Another example, I think it's Black Girl. I think that's a 60-minute movie, like right on the dot. But I imagine that has a lot of features to go along with it. So it's probably worth 40 if you pay it that yeah. price. Um but yeah, this probably should go down in price. I, I didn't even look close enough to know what features it had on it. But when I saw they announced it, I same thing. It should be the lower price. <laughs> I, I'm glad that we're getting the movie. I've got nothing against yeah. that whatsoever. And I want to see it. I think I think I have the movie release release of this already. Okay. Let me let me check. I had read it was on Hulu, and I did not realize that because I think a lot of the neon stuff is on Hulu. This is this is a neon distributed movie i think right uh, i think so i, I think so i think so um and portrait of a lady on fire is incredible so again if anybody's ever seen any of her other works definitely check that one out uh i understand this one's quite the tearjerker as well so i'm very happy to see it but yeah yes I mean, not that price 
yeah i yeah i'm all about that um yeah this looks like a it, i mean it's i bet it's a great movie i got nothing against them putting it out i just come on yeah there, there should be more on there uh make it a double pack with portrait like they did with yojimbo that would have been great yeah uh wave says definitely needs more special features kb says arsenic and old lace was pretty bare bones but i bit i mean not exactly it had a that at least had a commentary and uh in fact i think uh if you don't have it i can go grab it i think it's close let me see um i didn't have the radio adaptation on it as well i can go grab it let me see um let's see video store what's going on uh eric just watched it on hulu so maybe it's still on there so this release had New audio commentary featuring Charles Dennis, author of There's a Body in the Window Seat, uh, the radio adaptation from 1952 starring Boris Karloff, a trailer, and English subtitles, plus an essay by David Cairn. So it had it, it had a full-length commentary, and it also had the radio adaptation. I mean, that's I don't know how long this conversation is because they don't really uh, give us that information before it comes out. But, I mean, at least that had... I, I, God, the the commentary for arsenic is longer than the film on this. <laughs> I think so. If I remember right, I think that's like, yeah, that because that's almost a two hour movie. Anyways, yeah. Uh, I just uh, want to. I, I see the comment here at home Criterion Closet. Yeah. So right, right there, those are all Criterion up and down. <laughs> so, kinda, kind of like a closet. If, uh, if anybody's interested, friend of the channel, Nathan Jones, uh, who's been on here many, many times, he just built himself his own Criterion Closet, put up a video on it and everything. Make sure you go check out his stuff because, uh, yeah, it, it looks great. And then uh, finally, Criterion, the last week in May, on May 30th, we are getting Thelma and Louise from 1991. And this is getting a 4K release, and I'm very happy about it. Uh, so I personally, I really enjoy this movie, always have. I uh, saw this probably way too young. Um, but also, I mean, Ridley Scott, back in the collection. Uh, he, he was uh, in the collection originally on Laserdisc, I think? Probably, yeah. I will say, I don't think he's had anything else on DVD yeah. or Blu-ray, at least. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. I've never seen it. But again, I, I welcome these, like, mainstream release titles in here. I'm okay with that. I know some people get really snobby about it. Uh, but I, I want to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a wonderful movie and uh really great cover art. I, this is one of those that I would love for criterion to release like five or eight posters every year. Uh, even though I, as much as I rip on that Godzilla collection, that poster would look incredible on anybody's wall. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this looks amazing. I would love to have this as a poster. Uh, lots of special features on this. We got multiple commentaries, two audio commentaries, new interviews, a documentary. We've got uh, Scott's first short film from all the way back in 1965. We got storyboards, deleted and extended scenes, a music video, trailers, and, uh, and then new essays, which is just great. Like, this is a strong release. And yeah. it's entering the collection on 4K. I would love to see at least one to three like this every single month. Yes. If, if we're going to say you're putting titles out in 4K, then do it this way. Exactly. If you're going to do upgrades, limit it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to it as well. In in Fight Club, Sivner, he is he's very skinny. Uh, I, I wouldn't say he's jacked necessarily, but I'm, I'm also just the fat white guy calling Brad Pitt not jacked. I don't know. Yeah, he's kind of um, average. Justin says, I think Mondo released the Godzilla art as a poster, and it probably cost like $1,500 now. Good. I had no idea. Yeah. Mondo posters, they go up in price exponentially. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So TerraVision. Uh, they were on the channel yesterday, and they announced two titles coming available for pre-order next Tuesday. We get Copperhead, the Snake movie. This is from all the way back in 1984. And uh, they are doing a new transfer on the Tape Master for the shot on video oddity. And it will also have a bonus lost film called Motorhome from Hell, which, as they talked about it last night, sounds incredible. Uh, then, 
they are also going to be putting up End of the Line, which if you have not seen the trailer for this movie, go give it a look because it looks fantastic. Uh, this is from back in 2007, and uh, this was the same uh, director that did Slasher. I think it was called or Slashers, one of the two. And uh, they, uh, Brad, on Twitter, had somebody ask if they had any chance of putting out Slashers, and he didn't say yes. However, very coyly, he said something like, well, miracles can happen or something like that. So it seemed like we may be getting some more of those old uh, presented by Fangoria titles, which would be very interesting. I'm eager to see this one because uh, Brad, Brad said that this was a very like one of the scariest movies he's ever seen. Really? OK, I, uh, I, I pulled it up here on my YouTube, so I'll, I'll be sure to watch that trailer. Nice. From what uh, from what I could see yesterday, though, the trailer's very low quality. Well, I gotta admit. yeah, I mean, that's OK. All right. Speaking of upgrades to Criterion titles. Oh, my God. Does this look like an upgrade? Uh, so Second Sight on May 1st is giving us a 4K release of Picnic at Hanging Rock from 1975. And the art on this set is glorious. Uh, this looks amazing. And for anybody that doesn't know, the, uh, the the synopsis on this says, on Saturday, the 14th of February, 1900, a party of schoolgirls from Appleyard College picnicked at Hanging Rock near Mount Macedon in the state of Victoria. During the afternoon, several members of the party disappeared without a trace. On this, we are getting a new Second Sight 4K restoration from the OCN, supervised and approved by the director Peter Weir and... The DP, Russell Boyd, this is going to have two 4K discs and two Blu-ray discs. Both are going to have special features. There is a restored version of both the director's cut and the theatrical cut. There will be HDR on the discs. Uh, there is an audio commentary by Alexandra Heller-Nicholas and Josh Nelson. New interview with actor Karen Robson. New interview with the cinematographer. A new interview with the camera operator. And uh, something beyond explanation, Thomas Caldwell on Picnic at Hanging Rock, and a full feature-length documentary on the film. And this just looks remarkable. I mean, there's also a softcover book with new essays by Daniel Bird, Kat Ellinger, and Justine Smith, archival essays. Uh, and then on top of all that, this includes the original novel with exclusive cover art by the same artist that is doing the rest of the packaging. This looks amazing. Oh, yeah. I wish my wallet was thick enough to uh, get all these because I, anytime Second Sight announces something, I want it. And then I look at the price and I'm like, I can, I can wait. I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. You know, but yeah, it looks, looks amazing. Um, I like Peter Weir. I like some of the stuff I've seen from him. Just once again, I haven't, I haven't taken the time to watch this one yet. But. The good thing on the Second Sight stuff is they announced the standard edition the exact same time as the limited edition. And if you want just the movie on 4K, you can pre-order it right now from Grindhouse, from Diabolic, and I think even Orbit. So, yeah, it's amazing. This looks like a fantastic release. Second Sight, absolutely killing it. And uh, that is it. That is all of the new releases for this week, which... It was a pretty pretty light week overall for. I know I was bummed when I was looking through that it was so short. I was like, <laughs> I was ready to talk for at least two hours on these things, you know. But oh, we still might be two hours. It's still only been that's seventy fine. minutes. So that's fine. I'm down. <laughs> uh, after this, we always go over what is coming out next week. So let's yeah. dive into that. Uh, next Tuesday, we have the Magnificent Seven 4K from Shout Factory, Dazed and Confused 4K from Criterion. The Slumber Party Massacre 1 and 2 4K double pack coming from Scream Factory. Dragonheart 4K coming from Shout Factory. Remains of the Day 4K coming from the studio. Magnificent Warriors coming from 88 Films. Uh, Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit 4K coming from Paramount. The Hunter coming from Kino. The uh, Jess Franco 4K is coming from Blue Underground. Station 11 4K, the miniseries, is coming from Paramount as well. The Crimson River is coming from Kino, which I am dying to see. That's one I need to look into. Uh, Sci-fi and thrillers from The Vault coming from Mill Creek. 
Requiem for a Heavyweight coming from Mill Creek. The Silent Avant Guard set coming from Kino, which is another one I need to look at. Uh, Broker finally getting a physical release in the U.S., and I'm dying to see that one as well. Definitely need to look at that. Uh, Werewolf of Washington coming from Kino, another one I'm eager to see. Uh, the Old Way, Nicolas Cage's first Western, which is supposedly really bad, but I still kind of want to see it. Uh, let's see, The Retaliators, the one that we talked about last week, that is already coming out. Um, I think that's uh, Ring a Ding Rhythm, which is a, uh, I believe that's a Kino release coming. That's one that I'm going to be looking at as well. But I think that's it for the heavy hitters for next yeah, week. Nothing here looks too crazy, at least. Anything that you're jumping into quickly? Of these, uh, I mean, I'm not going to be picking up anything of these right away. Um, I could upgrade my Days and Confused. I just have the DVD of that. Yeah. Um, Slumber Party Massacre, I'll stick with my Blu-rays because that two and three feature uh, is always so expensive. Um, I'm assuming it still is. It uh, will be, yeah. And Remains of the Day... I have that just on DVD because it's a Best Picture nominee, and I don't really care for the Merchant Ivory stuff, so no on that. <laughs> totally get it. All right. We are now going to transfer into some David Lynch stuff. Woo. And uh, to to make it personal, why don't you share your, your history with David Lynch? So uh, let's take us back. Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm big screen now. Uh Back in 1998, 99, uh, he made a movie called The Straight Story. And I've shared this on here before, but I'll share it again. Um, that movie was filmed in my hometown of Lorenz, Iowa. And so I was five, six at that time. And when they were announced that they were making the filming of it, uh, my family were very interested in wanting to see... Uh, obviously the stars and it was so Richard Farnsworth and Sissy Spacek and actually watch them film. So uh, yeah, we went down there every night, like after school or it might've been like late summer. So, you know, those like late summer nights uh, and go and watch them film. And because of that, at such a young age, I just became so fascinated with everything with film, uh, whether it be the making of it, obviously who was in it, just films in general. So it's odd to say that a six-year-old was very influenced by the straight story and David Lynch, uh, but I'm one of those people. So, uh, so yes, that movie means a lot to me, and I'll be very happy to share more about it later. And Mr. Ryan is muted. Whoops. Uh, I... Uh... I'm still trying to get over my stupid uh, sinus thing, so I, I've had to clear my throat like 19 oh. times on mute already. Um, I am uh, ashamed to admit I still have not watched a straight story, even though you have recommended it like 512. I, I want to watch it with you. So I, I've told you I want to watch it with you. So hold off until we are able to get together and watch it. Absolutely, that is that is on the list for sure. Uh, my my history with David Lynch. I was trying to think of this earlier. I can't remember what the first one I watched was. Uh, it was probably Mulholland Drive. Um, it, it seems like it was right because I I saw like the famous scene. And uh, after that, it was like, well, this looks compelling as hell. I, I definitely want to see the rest of the movie. And from there, I don't remember what came first. Uh, I, I know that there's a, still a couple that I've not seen. Um, I still have not ever seen Inland Empire all the way through. I've seen parts of it, but it's just not, I don't know. I, it's not one that I can really grab a hold of. It's so difficult. Uh, I'm so excited for the Criterion release to come out because I'm going to force myself to watch it again. Um, <laughs> I watched that. I think it's been almost five years at this point since I watched that one. And I remember the night I turned it on or I, I put the, I put the DVD in and I was like, okay, this is three hours on the dot. You got this. And I, I kept checking the time, and I'd be like, okay, I'm an hour in. Keep going. Like, we, we got this. <laughs> two hours in. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm, I'm almost – I'm through. I'm almost there. And it's like two hours 45. It's like, I'm almost there. I, I, I'm going to do this, you know? Yeah. But holy cow. That's, that's a hard watch. It's really hard to recommend. 
It really is. Uh, and again, I still haven't even seen the entire thing. So it's it's one that I, I really want to uh, like. And Lynch overall is not even like one of my favorites. But uh, I, I have like this immense respect for most things that he's done. And David Lynch is, you know, the like the film bros have really grabbed a hold of David Lynch and made him like their their champion. But yeah. this is it's an interesting touchy subject because David Lynch is not somebody that you can just like mosey into and hang out for a minute and be fine with it and then leave. It's it's somebody that to even really grasp, you kind of have to dive in really hard. You have to dive in really hard. And I hate to say it. It's not homework but really reading up on some things and then rewatching and revisiting multiple times does help immensely on certain movies, um, which again, we might get into that further as the night goes on here, our conversation gets on. But um, yeah, the, like I said, when film bros got so attached to it, that was me at college. Cause I was, I went to school for film and that was always my, like, hey, I, uh, I was in the hometown of the stray story. You ever heard of that one? You know, and of course nobody ever heard of that one. I'm like, it's David Lynch. Hello. And then, oh, okay. But it's always trying to make my in, you know. Uh, Eric says, watched Inland Empire twice in the theater. Not my favorite, but really looking forward to seeing it again. And then following that up, Sibner says, went and saw in Inland Empire opening weekend. And this was December, so the heat was on high. I fell asleep multiple times. <laughs> I can believe it. I mean, it's it's just a nightmare, literally, to watch. Right. And the thing that makes it such a nightmare is because I think the way he filmed it, he literally didn't have a script for it, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So he just made it up as he went. So it's so not cohesive. Will, you do not have to join every time and say, hello, it's Will. I, I, I do have a memory, I promise. And I and also, hello, I love you. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy Long, also, hello, I love you. I'm glad you're here. Hello. Uh, we are about to break into David Lynch. So the thing that I uh, I framed very specifically when we were talking about what we were going to discuss, I said our five favorite Lynch projects, which uh, with Lynch, it makes perfect sense to frame it like that because it's not just a film necessarily. Mm -hmm. What's going on, Kubrick lover? Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, let's go into Lynch as a whole. So you started uh, very young with Lynch, and obviously Lynch has, uh, we'll say, slowed down quite a bit. I I'm going to ask, do you think he has uh, any masterpieces left in him? I really hope so. There's all the rumors of the supposed Wisteria project that he's supposed to be doing, and then all the stuff with the rumors with Netflix – because he put out, or they released that, uh, what did Jack do? Did, did you ever watch that one with the monkey? I did not, but I heard it was okay. pretty fun. Yeah, it's bizarre. Like It's up his alley. It's weird. So there's all these rumors. And then I was reading today something about um, like all these like cast members that were involved in Twin Peaks were cryptically tweeting over the last year, like the same phrase. And it's like, it gives me hope that's going to happen. But I just don't know. I mean, I'll believe it when I see it, I guess. But I really hope he... One final thing. I mean, The Return, Twin Peaks The Return, is a masterpiece. And if that's the last thing he does, then wonderful. But I, I would love just one more movie. Just one more film. You know? I feel like he's got one more in him. And then after that, he'll retire to tell us the weather, and that's it. And he hasn't done a weather report in, like, a month and a half. <laughs> and I feel terrible because when... Angelo Badalamenti passed away. I think that hit him really hard. And after that, he just hasn't done anything with that. Right. But a yeah. video store review says it perfectly. Like, and that was something I was wanting to touch was one thing that makes Lynch and his project so good yeah. is the score. Yeah. Without it, it wouldn't hit as hard. It's yeah. You know. I mean, I mean, most of I, I don't want to say any titles because most of the the ones that I'm going to mention tonight the uh, the score itself is instrument. The score yeah. is instrumental. Uh, that was a very bad pun and uh, unintended until I heard it out loud. Yeah. Uh, the score itself is instrumental to my enjoyment of the film. It is absolutely, uh, especially again, I don't, 
we'll we'll talk about the scores in a minute. Damn it! Yeah, I don't yeah. want to give any of these away. Uh, uh, let's just start then. What is uh? Let's start with your number five for your your list of favorite Lynch projects. Okay, I'm gonna cheat. You gonna always cheat. do. That makes sense. I know. I'm sorry. I've got notes here on my left, so if I look over to the left, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's so hard to pick just five because he only has ten films. All right, and I know we said projects, but he has ten films. Yep. So picking just half of it's hard. So one, I'm just going to clump all the remaining five together. Okay, let's let's get rid of Dune. I watched Dune tonight for the first time, actually. So uh, in preparation for this, and how, how was not... how was viewing that for the first time in 2023? Very difficult. I I very <laughs> much liked the Villeneuve version of it. I I loved that one, and it helped having my stepdad watch it with me because he is a massive fan of the book. So when we watch it together. He's sitting there. Uh, explaining a lot of things to me. And of course that helped my experience a lot. Um, but I really enjoyed that version watching this one tonight. It's tough. It's, it's a hard watch. It's, it's not terrible. It's just really flawed. Um, Makes sense. But so, so with that though, the other five, four, I guess. So if I had to include them all together, I, I guess I won't say them because I want to spoil what my top five would be. Exactly. Top ones would be. So, it's his other stuff that I'm not going to mention. We're going to clump it all into one category. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll get to there. So what? Uh, what is what is number five favorite project then? Did... Uh, if I if I had to choose of those, we're going to just say like Elephant Man, because that's not going to be in my top four. But Elephant Man is it's very obviously tame. It yeah. still has the weird surrealness aspect to it, but not by much. Um, I love the John Hurt performance. It makes me cry at the end. Um, it's just sad. <laughs> I mean, like it's just it's just a good story. The fact that uh, I love the fact that Mel Brooks produced it as well. That whole story is great. Um, it's just it's just a really good film. Uh, again, yeah, that that'd be my five if I had to pick that one. Of it is good. Yeah, I understand that. Elephant Man is is interesting. It's not my five, but it's a uh... It's a, it's a good, solid film. Mm -hmm. um, couple of comments I want to highlight before I do my five. Please. Distorted Vision says, do you think that Lynch took a break from Weather Report to work on his next project? Just a theory. The hard part is I think that's been a theory like four times. Um, there was, uh, God, there was that really popular rumor that uh, Laura Dern's going to Cannes. So uh, David Lynch was also off from uh, Weather Report for like two months. I bet they're going to be doing something together. And then oh, nothing else. I was in that theory and the rumors all the time with the Cannes Film Festival. Like I was, <laughs> I was so set it was going to happen. And then in the weather reports, he grew his hair and his beard out really long. Instantly thought that was for something. And I had thought maybe that was for Fablemans, which I haven't seen yet. But he's not sporting a beard in that, as far as I can tell. So yep. that wasn't that. So yeah, what I don't know what the purpose of that for was for, but. Speaking of that, I love the uh, name dropping Jeremy Long. Uh, he says, Spielberg told me a great story about David Lynch and getting him to be in the Fablemans. Uh, Jeremy Long last weekend spent a day with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson and Steven Spielberg in one day. Um, brag, 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 Jeremy. <laughs> Just give me crap. My number five favorite project. Uh, funny enough, I think uh, either the show last night or the show on Tuesday, I happened to wear a shirt from this one. Um, and I'm going to go with uh, a racer head. I, I love this movie. It is, we, I mean, all, first off, all of these are going to be weird. None of yeah. these are like normal, uh, easy to digest cinema pieces. Um, a racer head is one that uh, I, I do think I saw it early in his oeuvre when i consumed it and i'm glad that i did i think if i watched some of the other heavy hitters before racerhead i probably would appreciate it a little less yeah. um just because of how it hits nowadays and i i kind of think that happened with elephant man for me because i did see that one later than most of the others and i don't like it as much for sure uh eraserhead so i watched that again for the first time a few years ago and then i <laughs> Every fiber me hated doing this today. I skimmed through it while I was working because work was really boring, and I wanted just a quick refresher. And so I, I've got a TV right next to me, so I, I went through it, refreshed my memory on everything. Uh, and the thing that makes Eraserhead just so 
good in a way is just how funny it is. It's yep. so darkly funny because you have Henry, who is this like weird chaplain esque character and the way he walks and waddles. And I, I love it's at the beginning, the gag where he gets in the elevator. Like it's just funny. And you don't know whether or not you should be laughing or not. And then with the chicken and of course the baby. The okay, baby. So, okay. Yeah. So what do you think the baby is made out of? He's never publicly said what that baby is made out of. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a great question. I have no clue looking at it even now in like really great high def. It's not something that you can easily pick out or anything like that. There, the one that always sticks out to me is somebody has said it's a dead rabbit. I don't know. It's so <laughs> bizarre. Very well it could be. And if the chat um, has any, anything that they can say of what the baby was in her head, please let us know. Sibner says, I mean, probably a real baby. Uh, God, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not either. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, Eraserhead is weird. It's like a fever dream. Um, and then the other thing, as I uh, was recounting some of these today, I like it just sort of hit me. Eraserhead is 46 years old. I know, right? That is insanity. And it looks I, great. Yeah. It really does. That's 77. So. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, I think like obviously Star Wars out that same time, you know, but like, so we have decent quality movies, but like for as low budget and as painstakingly long, it took him to make that film. Oh yeah. It's great. The only thing I noticed today rewatching was, oh, you can see a string when he pulls uh, the sperm baby out of his mouth like you can see a string but okay that's not gonna hinder my <laughs> my watching of it but uh yeah good it's a good uh, one would i say start with a racer head probably not but justin says in one of his commentaries he tells the story about cutting a dead cat open and that's what inspired the scene with the baby guts so maybe a dead cat God, gross could be uh <laughs> I heard that ILM made the Eraserhead baby with the power of the computer. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so Eraserhead, if you've never seen it, the Criterion disc, uh, it looks great. I This is one that I would not be surprised if they tried to put out some deluxe 4K of this here soon. Yeah. Uh, I They're, again, probably not going to do anything different for bonus features, although it's Lynch and they are best buds, so who knows. I'd be okay with it because I just have the DVD Criterion release of it, so I'll I'll upgrade, you know. But I'm sure it would look very good with that black and white. So. Oh yeah, I bet it would. All right, what's your number four favorite Lynch project? We're gonna go with Blue Velvet. Uh, so this was after Straight Story, the next Lynch film I ever saw. Before Funny you continue, in... my yes. number four is right. Blue Velvet. Excellent. All right, great minds think alike. Yep. Uh, so I, I actually ended up watching this in college. That's how long it took me to watch in between. Um, great mystery. And it's a, this is a great start for Lynch. If, if you have to start with something of his, yep. if you're unsure where to start with, do you want something quote normal or do you want it's something one of the most surreal? normal? Yeah. This is a good combination of everything. Uh, great mystery. You got, uh, Entry characters that you're going to see in many of his other projects with Kyle McLaughlin, McLaughlin, Laura Dern. Uh, I think Dean Stockwell makes some appearances and other stuff. Yep. Oh, he was in Dune tonight, but he's in this. Um, of course, we never got any more Dennis Hopper. I can't imagine Dennis Hopper in anything later, Lynch. That'd be amazing. <laughs> but uh, I, I love the mystery to it all. Um, and like the coming of age kind of story of it too if you look further into that because uh he's this young kid coming home harry dean stanton uh i don't think he was he, he's not in blue velvet but yes i love harry dean stanton we'll talk about him later um but uh again the coming of age where he's coming home as this young kid and he is thrown into this awful adult world instantly and uh yeah it's it's just a good one. I don't know what more you want to add on that. I know you're highlighting comments here, too, and I want to read them. Yeah. Uh, so Blue Velvet, one of my favorites primarily because it is, uh, just like we just said a moment ago, like this is one of the easiest stories to relate to, kind of. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> as easier story as to a, follow. Because yes. that's, a, that's a criticism a lot of people have about him is, yeah. oh, this stuff's just so hard to follow. And what I said earlier was it's kind of like, I hate to say it, you have to do homework where you have to rewatch it a couple times where you maybe read up on some things. Blue Velvet, you really don't have to do that. You can you can pick up on everything in one sitting. Yeah. Um, and you get an amazingly terrifying Dennis Hopper. Like everybody knows Frank Booth as one of the scariest villains ever. Um, and for good reason. Yeah. Um, I I am a I don't know why, but I've always been a big fan of Kyle McLaughlin. Like in everything that he turns up, I'm like I love this guy. He's just so fantastic. I and love it is odd to see him in this movie doing the things that he does. And it's odd that he's in Dune and uh, others. Anyways, uh, I, I really enjoy him in this. Um, I think kind of understated. Uh, Isabella Rossellini is yeah. fantastic in this. So this good. is uh, this this is a movie that is not necessarily easy compared to, you know, the 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 just generic dramas of the day. But for Lynch, this is kind of his generic drama. And it's yeah. one that is uh, easy on the eyes, easy on the ears, easy on the mind, and one that I uh, probably have rewatched more than all but one, actually, as far as films. It's, I've seen it's, it's more than a couple times, too. Um, just because, like you said, it's just an easier watch and doesn't take a whole lot of effort, <laughs> you know, like... Uh, and a film that Roger Ebert famously also hated, so... Of course. Yeah, that's how it goes sometimes, sadly. Uh, what is your number three? I'm curious how many others we have uh, identical now. Uh, we'll see, I guess. So my number three, we're going to go back to the beginning. Uh, we're going to go with Straight Story. And I am, once again, was so delighted Imprint put this out because just any anything other than D the DVD is perfect. I wish this yeah. was so bad. Just get the Criterion release. But I will wait patiently. I'm only 30. I've got plenty of years ahead of me to wait on that. Uh, what makes Straight Story so good, though, is it's just that it's just that it's just so straight. It's so wholesome. It's so heartwarming. <laughs> uh, and the fact that it was in my hometown and it was such a uh, such a formative experience because there's scenes early on in the beginning that. Once again, if I sit there and I watch it with you, I'm going to try to shut my mouth and be like, I was there for that, or I was there for that. I'm standing right there for that. Uh, and then the fact that I was almost supposed to be in it as well. Yeah. Um, there's a scene near the beginning, about 15 minutes in, where Sissy Spacek is, she's looking out a window, and there's this little boy that walks up. Uh, there's a ball that rolls in her front yard. He goes and picks up the ball. He stands there for a second. He walks off screen. That was supposed to be me. And I wish so bad it would have been me because that would have been a fun reveal here. Uh, on here but um again the thing that i think i like it so much too is just it has that weird it's still surreal you know in a weird way even though it is very realistic um there's still that surreal undertone to it and it's because of the characters that alvin meets along the way and again you haven't seen it so if i name off characters you're not gonna know who they are but like the most famous one is the deer lady um there's a woman that he comes across that hits a deer in front of him and she gets out and she screams and all this stuff. And, and she goes on and her whole thing is I, they come out of the, the field. I never see them. And where do they come from? And she's just, she feels like she belongs out of twin peaks. Yeah, really does. Um, my only gripe I have with the film as a whole is some of the dialogue is questionable. And that's only because I'm from there and I can criticize that. So yeah. there's some things that they say that I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like, all right, but Anthony wants uh, some clarification. How did you miss being immortalized in the film? So if, story? if memory serves me right, we were literally, because we would go down to the shoots a lot and watch from a distance. Yep. And so my mom is very outgoing and makes friends with everybody and anybody. And so we made friends with some of the crew uh, and in, in many ways, like one, the crew, so my grandma also owned a consignment shop, a store. And so the, the blue jeans that Richard Farnsworth wears in the film for the entire film are my dad's because they needed a certain brand size, whatever. And my grandma had them in her shop. 
Uh, and then, like I said, we were down there every single night watching them shoot the film. So we just kind of got to know them. And uh, I was the right age. I was obviously very fascinated with it all. And when we got there late, uh, it was at the beginning of, if people can remember, early on, there's a storm sequence. And we got there and they're like, where were you? We were waiting for you as long as we could. And we, we wanted you in this scene. Now, would I have done it? I don't know, because I was so shy as a little kid. Right. I probably would have been like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. But I have to hope I would have, because I loved it at that time. I would have been all over it. Um, like, they, like it, er, There's a lot of helicopter shots of fields as well. And like we got to go visit the helicopters and see all the cameras they use and stuff. Like I was that fascinated with it all. So yeah, it's a bit of a bummer. You know, it was always going to be my like two truths and a lie was I was in an Oscar nominated film. Um, but yeah, this is one that people don't talk about a whole lot just because it wasn't so accessible for a while there. You had the yeah. DVD it's on Disney plus. If people do want to check it out, um, obviously this Blu-ray imprint, I don't know. I never know. So when these go sell out, are there, are there standard editions of it or is it just the slip cover that's out? It, it depends on the title. Sometimes they do standard. Sometimes they do not. I had no idea what this one had. I, I, cause I pre-ordered this the second it went up. I would not imagine that that one didn't get a standard. I'm pretty sure it did because it's Lynch. Yeah. But not entirely sure. Um, yeah, I love it. I, it, as a kid, I always kind of didn't like it because it was so boring and everyone hates it because, well, that's not what our town is like, but it's very good. I, again, will recommend for anybody watching. Good. I can go on talking about it longer. So, uh, I got to highlight Simner's comment just because this is hilarious. I met Kyle McLaughlin at Bon Jovi's Labor Day party. He was exactly nice. how do you expect him to be. I mean, what the hell? I love I love these comments. You guys are amazing. Bon Jovi's uh, Labor Day party. <laughs> <laughs> uh then we got uh video store review i'm gonna save your comment for just a second because my number three is it's funny how american audiences sleep on wild at heart it's much more popular in europe the only one of his films to win the palm door i love wild at heart it is my number three and this is the one before we went live that i told you i was gonna go grab the other release oh, okay i've got the shop factory release but this german media book is insanity for those that have never show seen off. it show it off i want to see I'm gonna, it i'm gonna make this solo because this is such a wild cover look at this thing uh oh. i like this is not what you you would expect for some art style for wild at heart and it looks fantastic love this thing uh yeah still sealed because i uh didn't get it this long ago and i'd watched the shout factory release right before i got this one in i love this movie um, it is fantastic. I love uh, most of the cast. I think Nicolas Cage is incredible. I think Laura Dern is remarkable in this. Uh, we have some other heavy hitters that have always made me happy. I mean, when you're talking about David Lynch and weirdo films, I the fact that we have Nicolas Cage, Willem Dafoe, and Crispin Glover in a movie together directed by David Lynch, like... It's like walking cocaine. I, I I don't even know how to explain like how manic some of this had to have been on set. Th this movie is a miracle that it exists with this cast. Um, on top of all that, like Diane Ladd is in this. Isabella Rossellini is back. Harry Dean Stanton is in this. Um, yeah, just, just a remarkable movie. Uh, I brought this one up uh, with Will just two weeks ago because I think the the romance in this is genuinely inspiring how much they are all about each other. They, they are two people just so in love that there is nothing else that exists in the world to them. Unfortunately, there is some pretty intense scenes that allow this movie to not end in the way that uh, they wanted it to end. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love this movie. I think that the, the final act is one of Lynch's best endings in anything that he's done. I think it is magnificently shot, especially that third act. I think that the um, the effects that they use with the whole shotgun scene is remarkable. It is so good. Uh, yeah. For, any, for anybody curious about that, 
and if you've not seen this and you don't know what we're talking about, I'm going to keep it vague. One of the best head explosions ever put to screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not scanner's level, and it's not maniac level, but it's up there. And yeah. I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to say any more, but... Yeah, uh, this movie, for anybody that's not seen it, like I, I think the Shout Factory release is still in print and very cheap and easy to get, and you absolutely need to see this. I I saw this movie probably second or third out of a lot of his movies, and it has just always stuck with me. This movie is kind of a masterpiece for me. I Yeah, and it's slept on because it's not, it's just not a popular title. That's literally right. the only reason why. It's just... There's so many other of his films that people are going to want to discuss more. Um, but it's, yeah, it's another great one. Uh, Willem Dafoe, Bobby Peru is so creepy. Like, yep. oh yeah, yeah, we still are. What's, what's Absolutely still talking about Wild at Heart and Silent Mandible. This is so worth it. Yeah, Bobby Peru uh, is one of the creepiest Lynch villains. He's not Frank Booth levels, but he's up there. Yeah. Uh, and the sequence at the bank where you've got him being psycho and you've got Nick Cage going full psycho. Yeah. You can't match that energy anywhere else. And again, this media book, as soon as I saw this, this was like a must own. And it's not just a regular media book, media book. This is one of those padded media books. So it's, it's almost like a upholstered on the outside. Oh yeah. Yeah. I need to, I need to rewatch wild at heart. Um, I don't have that shout factory one. I've got, I've got this old Kino DVD of it. Um, but once again, it's been a while, and I feel like the that's the bad thing about a lot of these is it's just been a while since I've seen some of these. Sibner wants to know who put this out, and it is Sinestrange. It is their number uh, thirty-two, uh, obviously universal title on the spine, and it was limited to three hundred and thirty-three for this cover only. And I got number one hundred and twenty-two, and it's a region-free disc. I mean, you you can't really go wrong. Yeah, that looks. Yeah, that cover is really, really cool. I don't remember big explosions in it, but, you know. Uh, Not yeah. really. Uh, and I, I did want to shout this out. Um, Eric had it ready before I could say it. Perdita Durango is based on another story in the series by Barry Gifford, and they are connected. There are uh, the same named characters in both films and both wild, insane movies, um, especially back-to-back. -back. And if you get a chance... Wild at Heart, followed by the new Severn 4K. Remarkable doubleheader. It is so great to watch them back to back. Now, does Perdita Durango, though, have Wizard of Oz imagery in it? Uh, I mean, I could probably make it make sense. <laughs> it's yeah. not a explicit Wizard does of Oz. The, when did the Good Witch actually show up? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is your number two, my friend? Okay. So we're talking projects. And I, 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 you can't talk about David Lynch without talking about Twin Peaks. Okay. It has to be included. Twin Peaks is a journey, an absolute ride. It's funny. It's sad. It's depressing as all hell. And it's mostly terrifying uh, and confusing. <laughs> but, uh, man, it took me a long time to get into Twin Peaks. I tried a few years back. Um, I made it like four episodes in. I was like, okay, I kind of like this. I'm into it. And I gave up on it. And then I got back into it and I was like, okay, I'm getting into this. And then I gave up on it. And then when I finally just pushed myself to finish it, I was so hooked. And then I finally got around to watching the return and binge through that as much as I could, as fast as I could. And yeah, what a journey. And have you seen all of Twin Peaks? I can't remember when we have last talked about, because I know you've got that awesome Zeta A box set. Yep. But I don't know if you'd ever actually seen the series all the way through. Yes, I have. And, okay, and Firewalk with me. Okay. Uh, once again, I, I went through Firewalk with me earlier when I was working today. Uh, I, this is maybe the scariest thing Lynch has ever put to screen. Am I being hyperbolic a little bit? Maybe, but like the ending to this is so scary, but do not watch this. Anybody in the chat that has not ever seen Twin Peaks, don't watch this first. This is a prequel. Do not watch it first. You have to watch the original series and then you can watch this. Yep. Um, but the way it ties into the return is incredible. And I don't know. Just, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. 
<laughs> it's the same thing that I liked so much about anything that he's done, and especially Twin Peaks, is just the ensemble of characters that he comes and puts together. Yeah. Everybody is so different and unique, and the characterization that each person has is remarkable. I love, like, Bobby. Bobby is such your standard, terrible, you know, kid. Small town, yeah. And then what he comes to be is amazing. I love Bobby. Bobby is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, I just, everybody. And of course, you can't have it without Kyle McLaughlin as Cooper. Without Cooper, you don't have Twin Peaks. I mean, he is it. So I can see why a lot of people might be skeptical on the return for a little while there because Dougie Jones, but Dougie Jones is amazing too. Um, but yeah, again, I could go on for a while about Twin Peaks. I don't know. I feel like you're going to have to like push me and like give me some questions here or whatever, but I don't want to because we're going to talk about it again. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, Uh, So my number two, I'm going to jump into it real quick because I feel like this is your number one now. Mulholland Drive. Yeah. Let's just, yeah, we'll just, we'll just do it here. So (laughs) Um, I I think that it is uh, a masterpiece. It is up there with, uh, like my my top three are nearly neck and neck for my favorites for Lynch. Yeah. I, I think that they are all three masterpieces in their own way. Starting with Wild at Heart, Mulholland Drive. Uh, just it might literally just be because it's the first one I saw, so it's a little more closer to me. Um, that I just adore it. I I think that it has uh, maybe some of the best acting in any of the Lynch projects for sure. And then of course. Is it really still on Scorsese? Thanks for that, Eric. Uh, on top of all that, uh, the 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 famous scene, the the dumpster scene, is such oh, yeah. uh, uh, an iconic. Like everybody needs to uh, watch this. And when you see that one scene, because uh, a lot of people see it as I don't like it's part of a compilation. That, that's how they first see that scene, and uh, like the hundred and one scariest moments in film or whatever. Uh, if you go and watch Mulholland Drive in full after seeing that scene, it doesn't quite have the impact. You really should see it before you get uh, acquainted with that scene. But overall, I mean, how long is this? It is two hundred hundred forty six. Yeah, so two hours twenty six. I, I thought it was three hours, but two and a half hours is still still just so amazing and, and so. Like it's the perfect length for this film as well. It's one of those things that, uh, with with certain films, there is no way that you can picture uh, uh, the film any different. Where you can't see a scene taken away or something added. This one is like that. There are other Lynch projects that are way too long. I could see certain things very much taken out of his films, but this is like the full complete package, and. Yeah. I adore that. It is so, so remarkably made. I love it. It's everything that, like, if The Return is his absolute, like, magnum opus, I feel like Mulholland Drive is obviously his film magnum opus. Yep. Because, as you just said, it takes everything that he has done and puts it all in one. It's got mystery. It's got a, a fantastic cast of ensemble characters. It's got the weird, surreal eroticism to it at times yeah uh it's got things that you just don't understand what's the purpose of this like the cowboy like what's a cowboy doing here you know yeah uh and like the diner that happens very early on in the film but and it makes no sense when you first watch it why is this here but after you watch you're like oh okay i get it now (laughs) you know and that diner sequence i don't want to tell you to just watch it by itself but you could and you still it's it's as perfect as a short film itself it's wonderful. It's, ah, I love it. And I met uh, Bonnie Aarons, who plays the bum and is the nun at Crypticon a couple years ago. And when I told her about that, she was like, I'm surprised people even know that I was in that or whatever. And people still like that. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, you terrified me, you know? But Silencio, yes, the ending is gorgeous. It is iconic. Uh, Sibner and Eric both said that the Silencio scene is more iconic than the diner scene. I I think when you've seen the whole movie, it's more iconic. But I because of the 
that scene from the diner being literally clipped out and shown as part of like the scariest moments in history, it is something that people see by itself first much more often. Yeah. So and it's so uh, early on in the movie too. It's that's like at the fifteen minute mark exactly. almost exactly. It's so early on exactly. Um, with characters that you're never going to see again. <laughs> Spoilers, uh, but everything makes sense when you do figure out why they're there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Mohan Drive is wonderful. That was another one too. That it's a it's another example of you got to watch it a couple times to fully grasp it. My first time watching, I was like, I really like this. I don't get it. I, I, I sat on it for a couple of years. The uh, the 4K came out. I think I had watched it a previous time before then, but then the 4K came out. I turned off all the lights. It was nighttime. And I just, it was just me and the screen. And oh my God, the experience was phenomenal. Like, oh. and seeing Billy Bob or Billy Ray Cyrus in 4K, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> So but, like I said, this was the first one I'd watched. And just like you, that first time I watched it, I went, man, I really like that. But I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. It's so dumb because this is this is like most of his filmography. Once right. you read up on it and you've seen it a couple times, you're like, that is so basic. Like Mulholland Drive is really a basic story. You're not going to get that the first time you watch it, which maybe is a detractor to some people. But it's a very simple story. Let's, And I'm not trying to sound pretentious as all hell, but like it's it's pretty simple but you gotta you gotta really get into it and focus it and you know read up on it and all that. it's a simple story that's very veiled over yes oh yeah absolutely um uh, yeah you go on I was number one me, right? number one for me we're gonna dive back in because my number one is twin peaks um mm -hmm. however i'm gonna i'm gonna change it up from what you said a little bit okay. i i love everything twin peaks Except I'm not a huge fan of the second series. Uh, oh, yeah, we need to talk about that. Absolutely. Like, yeah, second season is rough for many reasons. Uh, yeah. Mostly because Lynch was upset with the studio uh, yeah. for making him. The whole thing is who killed Laura Palmer, and it never <laughs> right. was supposed to be answered. But the studio's like, well, you're so popular, you have to, you have to answer it. And while <laughs> the answer that episode is incredible, that's one of the best. After that, I mean, it's just what show has what's a show that starts off so strong and then just nose dives? I think of something like like a like a Heroes or Lost, Lost or something like that. It's like <laughs> it starts off so amazing and then it just crashes and burns, you know. And, and, and even then, like on rewatches, I don't I don't hate the second one uh, as much as I did the first time I watched it. I don't either, I, I, but it's just not it's not up the the standard. Right. It's it's certainly not on par with the first one. And now, like, the return is this exponential increase of quality that is so difficult to grasp grapple with when you look at the second series and compare it. And obviously, there's, what, 22 years between whatever? It's, 25, yeah, I think. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's it's crazy, absolutely crazy that it, it, it is so much better than the second series. Mm -hmm. um, the film... I, I'm so glad that the film is a part of everything. It is, again, like you said, so well made. But this is the main reason why I had to say that it was Favorite Lynch Projects. Because this, this as a whole, like when you dive into a world that has somebody called the Log Lady, and you just know what that means. The fact that uh, Kyle McLaughlin's love for coffee and donuts is just, it's his own character. Uh, the fact that it's got the the tie to people under the stairs and it's the two characters like everything about this whole universe is so well thought out and so just weird and it it's immersive in a way that projects usually are not during uh filmmaking there's nothing like this that gets people to pour out everything into it anymore like this it's astonishing it's impressive it is it's a masterpiece overall, oh, yeah. just period. And once again, my favorite ensemble of characters there, you can name off 10 characters, no matter how big or small from the series. And I'm going to be like, Oh, they're amazing. I love them. Got up. You know, I love like, uh, again, like Bobby. Uh, I love his dad, uh, major Briggs, probably one of my absolute favorite characters of the series. If you, if you watch the episode where, his dad talks to Bobby in the diner and you don't shed a tear, something's wrong with you. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, what a good show. But unfortunately, that second season is just once once you get about I think it's like episode nine. Once you get past that, you could theoretically skip to the last episode because that final episode is also incredible. But you might as well watch it. It's only a few. It's like yeah, it's like twelve episodes. You know, you might as well just watch them. You know. Sibner is reminding us to read Room to Dream. Lots of great stories in there. Eric says Lynch was off making Wild at Heart during the second season, and I don't think that timeline matches up. I think Wild at Heart came out long. Wild at Heart's 90, and Twin yeah. Peaks the first season is 90 as well. So there may be overlap, but I don't think with the second season. I don't think so. Um, yeah, that, that second season is it's just odd. Very, very odd. You've got you've got Ben Horn acting like he's a Confederate general. You've got James riding off on his motorcycle, having an affair. That's where it gets like the whole series is like a parody of like soap operas in a way. Yeah. That's where it really gets too soapy for my liking. Yeah. Um, and then of course it ends on the worst cliffhanger. <laughs> Thank God for the return. But like yep. that, cl- I can't imagine. I was obviously not even born when, <laughs> The original run came watching out it week to week imagine yeah and i know how i felt now when the return ended like i'm like oh my god but <laughs> i can't imagine 25 years earlier with the uh, yeah. season two ending how big of a shock that would have been interesting uh so flex i know this is off topic flex wants to know if megan will have a 4k it looks like not uh as far as mm-hmm. i'm aware i believe it is only getting a blue have you seen is... megan yet I have not. I'm yeah. dying to see. Did you go see it? No, I haven't. I, I I'll be honest with you. I haven't. I haven't been to the theater. Okay, so I went. I went just on Sun or Monday night. I'll tell that in a second. But before that was Top Gun Maverick, which I know you always like grimace at every time that's come up in discussion. But Top Gun was fun. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but after that, yeah, so then we, we went and saw uh, Titanic, the 4K oh, nice. remaster in IMAX, and oh my god. That movie has never looked better. <laughs> like, it awesome. looks amazing. The 3D was a little eh at times, but trust James Cameron. <laughs> like It's an incredible movie. Yeah, it's wonderful. But uh, no, I did not see Megan. Uh, I would like to see it. I, I have a feeling I'm not going to be in the camp of this is the most amazing thing ever, like some people are. Because, like, you're a big, like, Malignant fan. Oh, yeah. Right? I kind of hated Malignant. <laughs> and I think my reason was I just, I got it. But at the same time, I was like, okay, this is sin, whatever, you know. And I'm afraid I'll fall on that with Megan. Right. You know, I know what they're going for. But, you know, so I do want to see it, though. Yeah, it looks fun. The TikTok um, man, you know, uh, got me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Twin Peaks, for anybody that has not seen it, highly recommend it. Um, you really should watch it in release order. It is yes. something that you will get the most enjoyment out of it that way. Don't I know that there's been you know blog posts throughout the years that have you know suggested different watching orders and different even chopping up the seasons into watching no. episodes out of order. I, I don't understand no. that at all. The uh, only thing I would ever suggest chopping out of order is uh, like the Star Wars franchise. You watch that in machete order, yeah. do that. Do not do that with Twin Peaks. No, you have to watch that in release. You watch it season one, season two, Fire Walk with me. And if you're really liking it, watch The Missing Pieces and then do the return. And then there are books to go along with them. Now, unfortunately, I have not ever read the books. Me neither. Um, I have attempted to look at them by like Barnes and Noble because I like to pick up my stuff locally, even though Barnes and Noble's not obviously like a mom and pop store, but it's just down the road, you know, I can just go pick it up there, but they never have had it in stock, you know. Um, they've got, like, Laura Palmer's diary. I think they have Cooper, his, like, audio logs with Diane. Um, and then I think there's, like, the... There's a big, like, culmination that I think Mark Frost wrote of, like, the history of Twin Peaks. He might have done, like, one or two of those. Um, I would like to read them, but, yes, uh, DC's got his comment. They're pretty much all mark frost i don't think lynch had any hand and if he did it probably wouldn't be much but i don't think lynch wrote anything with the books yeah um but yeah what a good show i i'm due for another good rewatch because it's been a while again i covid has screwed with my time 
perception so much. I feel like I just watched the series and I realize it's been three, four years at this point. So Yeah, that uh that makes sense. Yeah. It's it's one of those things that it's it's very gratifying to not necessarily binge, but watch quickly and get it all together. Uh, but at the same time, it's also one that is really difficult to absorb everything that close together. Mm -hmm. So if you can, like, I don't want to say binge necessarily, but try to watch all of it within like a, say like a six month period. Yeah. Uh, rather than spreading it out too, too far. There's a lot to absorb. Totally get that. And it's Lynch. So it's heavy and just messy at points, but it is so, so worth it. And the return is so different compared to, yes, an erotic history of the log lady sounds <laughs> so. Oh, thanks, Will. That's the Colson, though. Like, what a performance. And especially in the return. Like, yeah. That's a courageous. If anybody doesn't know, Catherine Coulson, the log lady, had terminal cancer, and she still filmed her scenes. And uh, yeah, what bravery for her to do that um, is incredible. And that's the crummy part about Twin Peaks. Okay, so going back to uh, what's a project if he had one more project in him? I had read actually earlier today. People theory that people have is a Twin Peaks season four, but we're pretty much totally new cast of characters. How would you feel on that? Same universe, same everything, Black Lodge related, but we're not having the same people. If it's the same quality, I'm not necessarily against it at all. Yeah, because we've lost so many people. That's the problem that I, I have with it. So many major people have passed away. Nice. Simner says, I'm rewatching Twin Peaks with my girlfriend. Her first time, season two, episode four right now. That's... Mm -hmm. Uh, best of luck. And I want you to write in the chat, but I really, I really would love to know theories that, that she <laughs> might have because we're yeah, you're getting there. So, uh, Lynch. Um, I just realized when we talked about uh, Mulholland Drive, I failed to list two things that I absolutely should have. Uh, first off, Robert Forster is in <sighs> Mulholland Drive. Yeah. That alone, like that's reason enough to watch it if you never have. And then the other thing, I have adored Naomi Watts since i was like 14 and that's not meant as like a young boy mm -hmm. uh, fantasy type of thing but for some reason she was just super magnetic for me and and i love the way she acted and i don't know why because it's not like she's uh, a really like over the top actor or anything like that she's very understated in most everything she does um but i loved her in this loved her in the ring uh loved her in funny games and and all of those those thriller-esque films she absolutely kills it. Oh, yeah. She's wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Robert Forrester. He's not in Mulholland Drive much, but no. again, he's Robert Forrester and he's in The Return. So if you do like Robert Forrester, definitely check out The Return once you get through the earlier seasons and Fire Walk with me. Um, there was a comment here earlier, too. Somebody had said about episode eight. All you need to know is just the words episode eight of The Return. <laughs> I think they said it was the scariest hour of TV. Yes, that's all you need to know. That's all you got to know. Oh, yeah. um, oh, wow. Will says, hot take. Naomi Watts was the greatest actor of that generation. Damn. I, I mean, I wasn't going to say it. I I would almost say up there with, uh, I mean, I know she was younger, but Tony Collette showed a hell of a lot of power back then, too. So we're saying generation. So just around like turn of the century. Yeah, turn of the century to like 2005. I mean, yeah. Tony Collette in The Sixth Sense. Okay. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, we can go on about Tony Collette all night. but Yeah, we really could. Like, yeah, yeah I, I was I was just going to jump into doing it. The fact that the fact that she did that and then followed uh, how many years? It was like 2011 when uh, that that one movie that God, what the hell is the name of it? 2011? Yeah, I might be wrong with that year. It's probably a little bit earlier. But you're still on Tony Collette. Yes. Uh, why well, I am like blanking because I'm so tired right now. Tony Collette. Uh, let me see. Somebody else is probably going to put it in the chat because they've heard me talk about it like 19 times. Oh, uh, frick. There's that one underground movie she did. I think it's called Heredit. Her hereditary not talking about hereditary obviously she is brilliant in hereditary um 
Uh, good Lord, she did a lot of stuff back then. Oh, I missed it by a lot. Uh, 2006, Little okay. Miss Sunshine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She Absolutely. was freaking amazing, Little Miss Sunshine. That's a good one. I Heart Huckabees. Isn't Kate Winslet in that group? I, Kate Winslet, for me, I, I don't think she took off for me as an actress until uh, maybe a few years later. Like, obviously, she was amazing in Titanic, but... Um, and Eternal Sunshine. Okay, yeah, Kate Winslet. So, yeah, I had better appreciation for Kate Winslet on Titanic. For a while there, my only gripe with Titanic was like, oh, some of the acting's not that great. But then I watched, I'm like, that's eh, it's really good. Like, <laughs> I, I still think Leo is my like weak point of that movie, but he's still good, you know. Yeah. But... I, I, yeah, Leo is. It's hard to. Leo is very young, and that cast has to be intimidating as hell. I mean, to be around Kate Winslet and Kathy Bates and, like, that age, to be around Billy Zane. In Billy the, Zane? We're really tying it all back. Billy Zane's in Twin Peaks. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Naomi Watts was good in Down, a.k.a. The Shaft. <laughs> Bitanic is a good movie, too. <laughs> oh man uh yes Watson, heavenly creatures i haven't seen that i we had a foreign exchange student dude right? good call Sorry. in seventh grade from brazil and a movie that he really liked that he wanted me to watch and we i bought it but unfortunately we never watched it together it was 21 grams you ever seen that one i don't think i have but it did just get a mention 21 grams is a plus plus not a great movie <laughs> Yeah, he uh, he loved that one. He always wanted me to watch it, but we never watched it together. Um, but yeah, that's one that's been on the shelf too for a long time, and I just never gotten around to watch it. Uh, Sibner says there's a line in season two of Twin Peaks which has Billy Zane, which is then repeated back to him in Titanic. Yes. So yeah, that's. I I feel like that's never been. I feel like I, there's like something that's never been confirmed. Like to James Cameron if he pulled that from Twin Peaks it has to be clearly because right. it's to Norma says it to her husband Hank that line of I'd rather be his whore than your wife and obviously that's verbatim in Titanic and I think I think the thing was in that same episode is when Billy Zane's first introduced yeah there has to be a connection but I feel like again there's never actually never been a confirmation so uh I need to meet James Cameron, and obviously uh, Jeremy meets everybody, so if Jeremy meets James Cameron, can you please, please pass a message along? We'd really appreciate it. How do you feel about this? Uh, Will Gish says, Kathy Bates is a top 10 American actor of all time. Hashtag I hot. I have a hard time saying like top 10, but yeah, Kathy Bates is always on her A-game. She really is. I really like her. Um, I can't say top 10 because there's just so many people, but, um, you can't deny that she's good when, uh, she gets an Oscar for a horror movie in misery. Yeah. I, I oh, think like, that that is maybe one of like the top t 10 or 15 single performances in a film yeah. ever. Yeah. Especially for, if you're going to even narrow it down more to, uh, let's say best actress winners. Yeah, I feel like she has to be in consideration Absolutely. for a top ten. Yeah. She wouldn't be my number one, but she's very good. Um, I'm trying to even think what other Kathy Bates stuff that I've seen. She's in so much. The Squirrel Lady and Rat Race. I mean, like, come on, what a small <laughs> role, and she's like the most memorable part of that movie. You know, Rat Race is really funny. All right. I, I love Rat Race. Okay, I got good. nothing against because it. I feel like that's I don't like to use the term underrated. You know me, you've seen my rants on underrated versus underseen. I feel like Rat Race is just oh yeah, it's the tinge. Rat Race is, is certainly underrated. I do it feel like it was tinge. seen properly at the time. Yeah. Um I will throw out I know we've gotten two mentions of Waterboy or three three mentions of Waterboy now. Waterboy, she is great in that. However, I'm gonna throw out something that is not talked about as much anymore, especially because the frickin' Sopranos and The Wire have overpowered it. But her role in Six Feet Under is one of the best parts of the later seasons of that show. I loved Six Feet Under. And she plays this enigmatic hippie lady that comes in as, like, this whirling dervish of, 
just uh, interrupting somebody's life. And she is so, so great in Six Feet Under. Always loved her. And she was only in like seven or eight episodes. That's a show that I really want to see because I always hear the ending is that last episode is phenomenal. And I've never had it spoiled. So like I want to do it, but it's like any show that how many seasons is that six? Six five or, or six five. but they're not they're not super long it's hbo season so it's it's only like 10, 10 episodes per. a season I, I would like to even like sopranos i tried doing sopranos like a year or two ago and that should be a show that i like love yeah i made it seven episodes in and i didn't i just gave up and it wasn't a lack of interest i just stopped watching i can't well, imagine like, doing that i know it's terrible especially for a show <laughs> like that like I love mafia stuff, you know. I should be up my alley, but I just, I just stopped. I don't know. I feel like that'd be the, my problem with Six Feet Under is I would just stop, not out of hating it. Just I would just stop watching. Six Feet Under is fascinating because, uh, you know, you mentioned how the ending hasn't been spoiled for you. It no, is I've never one had of those. I've never had the ending spoiled. I, it, but it, I, I understand it's amazing though. It's one of those endings that is very difficult to spoil because okay. it is a culmination of the entire series that makes it so fulfilling. Um, it's got an incredible, incredible, like philosophical ending that people are referencing when they say the ending is great. But the whole final episode is just ending of storyline after ending of storyline. And it wraps it up in such a, a beautiful way. And when you're surrounding your entire show around death, yeah, there's a lot of beauty that you would not expect in, in a show like that. Once again, it's on the shelf. Just got to get into it, you know. Dylan says it is five seasons with 63 episodes. Okay. And they're, of course, they're HBO, so they're about an hour. Or so yeah. if I could binge through a Breaking Bad, which is 48 minutes, and that's the exact same amount of episodes and seasons, I can certainly yeah. do six feet under, you know. And it, it's very good, especially because it's. <laughs> It's one of those where every episode, it's a serial, basically, where it's one contained story, but it also has things that affect the next episode. And the mm -hmm. fact that every single episode opens with an interesting death, it is such a great show, primarily because of that. You get to see um, really interesting character actors come in through this entire thing. Yeah, I, I haven't talked about uh, Six Feet Under a lot on here. I was going to say, you said character actors. Isn't it, isn't, uh, isn't it Richard Jenkins? He's the very first. Okay, yeah. He, well, he's the patriarch he's the, of the main family. Yeah, yeah, but he's the first. Yes. Uh, yeah, so. But he, he is not gone after that first episode. You you okay. see him a lot throughout the show. All right. And Richard then uh, yeah, he is always amazing. Uh, <laughs> I, I love right as Roland pops in here and says, what's going on? What's up, Roland? Uh, I was about to say, anybody else have any questions? Because I think we're about done. Uh, well, see, you know, we went over, we went I was going to say, you know, we should do real quick since we're we covered most of them. We should just cut. Let's just cover quickly the ones that we didn't talk about at all. All right. And, and the sad part here, two or three of the others I've not seen just because they don't really That's interest fine. me that much. So, so we talked elephant man briefly. Uh, we talked about all the other ones. Dune. I said, I watched this tonight. Very slow. Very boring. Uh, we barely touched inland empire again. This is a tough watch. And the only one we really didn't touch on was lost highway. Uh, like yeah. that up. But I struggle with lost highway. I don't know. Have, did you ever watch? Yeah, it's it, it's not for me. It's it, it's out of that realm of ones that I appreciate even a lot. Uh, I do appreciate the recent Criterion release. I think it looks fantastic. Uh, very impressive presentation for what it could have been. Um, I don't. It's not. It's not. It's barely even like mid tier Lynch for me. Yeah, I would agree. It's it's not. It's not in my obviously top five, and it wouldn't be even. It's probably if I had to rank it, it's probably like eight or seven. Like it's pretty low there out of the ten. Yeah. Uh it's another one I did not understand the lick of it the first time I watched it. Did not. Sat on it, watched the 4K here. I get it a little better. I still think it's sloppy. Yeah. But I would recommend it just to say if you like Lynch, you want to obviously see yeah. it. You get a really creepy Robert Blake performance. Everybody knows the mystery man. Um, and the, I think the film, the soundtrack is more legendary than the film itself. You've got that Trent Reznor and oh, yeah. all that other artists of that time on that soundtrack. Um, but yeah, great director. Gotta love him. Will says, uh, never seen Lost Highway, but bumping that soundtrack in middle school bangers from Smashing Pumpkins and Nine Inch Nails. Yep. Yeah, I, again, I think the soundtrack is more legendary than the movie itself. 
and and it makes me laugh because he does Lost Highway. Yeah, there you go. He, he does Lost Highway, and then he does the Straight Story, and then he does Mulholland Drive. <laughs> what a three run! Like, what, what a weird sandwich. <laughs> what a weird sandwich, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, so David Lynch is fantastic. If you've never uh, dove in, there's only really two or three that I would suggest starting. Probably only two that I would suggest starting with. But which ones did you say you hadn't seen? Because you said you hadn't talked about them. I, I have like no interest in watching his version of Dune. Okay, yeah, None I, I wouldn't all. recommend it either. I mean, I, I did it reluctantly tonight because it was on the shelf and we're going to talk about this. And I'm like, I better just do it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I would not recommend. <laughs> um, I have, st- uh, I, I think I said this earlier. I've still not finished Elephant Man, uh, or maybe I have. I, I, I think I have. Um, but uh, have not gotten all the way to uh, Inland Empire. You said uh, Inland Empire, and then uh, short, uh, short story. That's it. Straight story, yeah. Which we will watch together. I don't know why I said short story. I meant straight story. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not really short, but yeah. <laughs> it's nothing from Lynch's short. No. Not at all. <laughs> Not even his shorts are really that short. Uh, yeah, this has been fantastic, and uh, I really enjoyed this. Lynch is not one that a lot of people would love to talk about, so I'm glad that you were open to it, and yeah, uh, hope people have enjoyed it. That's a uh, it's it's a tough it's a tough thing to even provide discourse on because it's hard mm-hmm. to not spoil films right. while also trying to give the tone of these and. With these, there are certain aspects, kind of, of all of these films that if you spoil one part of it the whole film can lose a lot of the luster and it's not even like twists. It's just thing. Things are weird about the mm-hmm. movies. And if I just tell you one of the weird things, it kind of ruins that movie for a, a certain aspects. Mm-hmm. And I hope I didn't do that at all tonight. I, I, I was trying to put the cell on a lot of these. Yeah. I don't think I want you did. people to, to seek them out if they haven't ever. Um, but yeah, as you said, you got to just go in as blind as possible and then read up on everything. Yep. Uh, yeah. What did Jack do? As DC put, that's that was one of his shorts that he done on Netflix with the monkey. Yeah. I I honestly don't remember anything about it, but you know. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Uh, Anthony says it's been fun. Jeremy says, "Am I the only person that kind of enjoys Lynch's Dune?" Probably. Maybe. Because uh, even Lynch doesn't really enjoy. No, it. he want he took his name <laughs> off of it too. Like. Uh, and if you want to see Sting in a giant like bikini thing, like Speedo, and uh, I can't think who the actor is by name, but he it's the Baron, and he like, did you ever see the the newest Dune at all? Uh, the, no, okay. I actually have not. So the, the 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 one of the main villains is it's the Baron, and he's played by Stellan Skarsgård in the remake, and he like he floats, but he's got this like long like. Almost looks like a, a tail on him, you know, because he's floating in the air. But yeah. in the Lynch version, he literally floats like a balloon. It's really silly, and he's got all these like boils and warts on his face. It's it's bizarre, but hmm. it's uh, and yes, it is Sting, not the wrestler, but in fact the musician, <laughs> uh, and also Patrick like Stewart, Sting the wrestler in a in a speedo uh, when he wrestled. But uh, yes, yeah, Sting of the police. In a big old speedo. Sting, Patrick Stewart, Kyle McLaughlin, and uh, yeah. Virgin- Virginia Madsen. I don't even know who Virginia Madsen was in it. Right. And she then Patrick is... Stewart is has been old all his life. And yeah. he looks hella old in this one, too. <laughs> Virginia Madsen is uh, the princess in Dune. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. <laughs> Didn't even pick up on that. What? KB, I hope you're feeling better. It, it sucks that you fell. It, it was nasty out there. All right, everybody. Thanks for giving it a watch. Uh, We will be back next Thursday. But like I said, um, if you want to hear some more conversation with uh, Will Gish, who was commenting earlier as the Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society, I have a long conversation with him coming out tomorrow. I've got a review video from Imprint Items about to be dropping. Uh, But the important thing that I really wanted to highlight at the end here, it is Thursday, February 16th, and in just three days... We have the Shelf Shock Rewind Awards that are going to be on this channel, on the Shelf Shock YouTube channel, on Twitch, everywhere. Uh, This is going to be a big deal. We have a lot of people with videos already ready to go in this. We've got a lot of people with their hands involved. It is huge. On top of all that, 
we have a ton of giveaways to do Sunday night. So if you want a chance at multiple things, we've got uh, multiple Grindhouse video gift certificates. We've got uh, a box set getting donated by Orbit DVD. We've got uh, some other stuff that you'll see on Sunday. Um, Sibner, it is at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Pacific. And I can't freaking wait. I'm so excited for you guys to see these results. Uh, but until then, please get the word out. Get as many people involved as you can. Uh, as usual, I want to say thank you to the people that keep the support on this channel going. All of the patrons, you guys are amazing. And uh, just like I highlighted last time, uh, last night, I'm not going to do this every single time. But Brad Henderson of TerraVision and used to be a Vinegar Syndrome is now a patron and in the Discord. So if you want hands-on information from Brad, come come hang out in the Discord and uh, ask away. He is open to answering questions. And uh, yeah, we're, we're eager to have you during the show. We had, we had another person become a patron. So thank you, Shane. You'll get the personalized shout-out. I appreciate you all. And until uh, next time, we'll see you then. See you guys.